And we did see that 30-year Treasury yield go up on the heels of this feeling that the Treasury would be borrowing a lot more money than it previously had expected. Just to give you a sense of what we're looking at today, 8.15 a.m., we get a sense of the employment market with the ADP employment report, which we've always said no one cares about until they do. This comes after jolts. Uh, the job openings fell to the lowest going back to April 2021 yesterday. So you are seeing a deceleration here. And whether it is orderly and a soft landing type of deceleration or not is something we're trying to parse through. 8.30 a.m., this may be the most important issue of the day. The Treasury is releasing a refunding policy statement where they're expected to say they're going to borrow, as you've mentioned, a uh, trillion dollars in the third quarter. $274 billion more than initially expected. This was what caused the 30-year Treasury to surge yesterday. This is what people are looking at when they look at interest rate expenses that have ballooned by 50% in just a year to nearly a trillion dollars. And then uh, what we get after the bell, Qualcomm, TripAdvisor, Zillow, Etsy, Coca-Cola, uh, hotels uh, and MGM resorts, a lot of earnings as we take a look at incredible gains, particularly with some of the less loved stocks of the last year. What does this tell us about the economy? What does this tell us about the strength of the U.S. Uh, that people are pointing to that should just absolutely eradicate any concerns about political drama, right? Do we see ongoing sense that people still want to go to all sorts of hotels and gamble and buy homes, and even if the mortgage rate's high, it doesn't matter, and Qualcomm is going to be coming up with chips? I mean, this is the U.S. dynamism that people are talking about. Double-digit gains. I'm pleased you brought up the Treasury refunding announcement, 8.30 Eastern Time. On the same day, the Treasury Department increased its net borrowing estimate for the current quarter to $1 trillion from $733 billion. You've got the likes of Secretary Yellen calling the move to downgrade the country arbitrary and outdated. Let me share the quote with you. This decision does not change what Americans, investors, and people all around the world already know. The Treasury securities remain the world's preeminent safe and liquid asset, and that the American economy is fundamentally strong. Now, fundamentally strong, that backs up the amount of people who have dropped their recession call over the last few weeks. I get it. The timing of this feels really, really weird. But on the same day, they've had to increase their net borrowing estimate by as much as they've had to. Lisa, is it really arbitrary and outdated to bring up these issues again? I don't think it is. Especially if we're not supposedly bailing out an economy, right, that's in distress, which was the point that we've been hearing about. Where is the ammunition to do that? And this is some of the uh, sort of push-pull as we try to dismiss this as just, ugh, Fitch, what are you thinking? You're just going to be dragged under the mud, just like S&P lost a lot of credibility, just like Moody's, all of the rating agencies. After 2008, they all lost a ton of credibility, and yet they do point out things that are having real market implications, particularly yesterday with the refinancing agreement. Wall Street saying there's a chorus, you know, right now, we don't care about Fitch. I think the rest of the country, what's Fitch? Anne-Marie joins us now, Bloomberg Washington correspondent. <laughs> AMH, the market fallout this morning is limited. The political fallout is pretty loud. Can you walk us through the blame game currently in the nation's capital? Well, we had Libby Cantrell of PIMCO on yesterday as this was breaking, and she was talking about the fact that this is just going to be used as the latest political cudgel against the Democrats and against the Biden administration. So what you already see Republicans talking about is they're blaming Bidenomics for this. But let me give you a little bit of taste of what the Biden campaign is blaming. They say this is a Trump downgrade. It's a direct result of an extreme MAGA Republican agenda defined by chaos, callousness, and recklessness that Americans continue to reject. So, Jonathan, this is going to be used as the latest economic weapon both parties want to use against each other. But the bottom line is it happened while Biden is in the White House. So Republicans are going to use this in November of 2024 when you know that Americans are concerned about the economy. We just saw this latest national poll from The New York Times and Siena number of interesting tidbits from this poll, especially given the fact that you do see Trump just dominating his Republican field. You also see it likely is going to be a Trump-Biden uh, matchup that could be very close if it is those two individuals. They look neck and neck. But then if you look into more questions of the poll, how do you feel about the U.S. economy right now? Do you think it's doing well? Only 2 percent said exceptional. 49 percent said poor. So the economy still rates as a top issue for American voters, and this doesn't bode well for the sitting president. We've got to talk about some legal issues as well, so stay close, Anne-Marie. We'll catch up with you in a couple of minutes' time. I want to bring in Henrietta Trace into the conversation, Economic Policy Research Director of Veda Partners. Henrietta, first of all, just your initial reaction to that move yesterday evening from Fitch. Uh, my first reaction as somebody who was a staffer at the time on the Senate side is, you have got to be kidding me. This is not going to be well received. 
Um, but the first thing I wanted to get across to our clients was effectively, Congress is not going to like this. This is not going to be something that members say, oh, look, I was right. This is a great time for me to have this conversation. I'd also like to push back just a little bit on the narrative that President Biden is going to be the one that is blamed here. Um, as folks from 2011 will recall, the uh, then House Majority Leader Eric Cantor got primaried and lost his race, and then Speaker Boehner was out shortly thereafter. Obama, of course, won re-election. So I do think that it's important to think of who gets blamed in these kind of fiscal debacles, whether it's a government shutdown, which historically is where the blame lands with Republicans. And that's why uh, the Senate Republican leadership, including Mitch McConnell, do not encourage uh, the House Republicans to go forward with a shutdown narrative. This is not something that is as cut as dry as who is the president and then who gets blamed. And we saw that the first time around in 2011. But the first reaction I have is a sort of a visceral uh, you got to be kidding me. Well, but Henrietta, there is a question about who uh, in the presidential candidate's race is going to come out and say, we plan to cut the deficit, and oh yeah, here are the benefits that you're not going to get as a result of it. We're getting some of the Republican candidates' plans, and it looks a lot like the former President Trump's plans, where he talks about not cutting anything, uh, but having fiscal discipline. Where is that fiscal discipline going to come from? Uh, that's a great question. You know, I come through um, Ron DeSantis's economic agenda, and, and part of it, it's either, it's a little bit unclear, but there's a fourth estate that he plans to abolish, which is either bureaucracy or the press, and I can't fathom for the life of me how either one of those gets 3% GDP growth or reduces the deficit. Um, unsubsidizing electric vehicles, again, I don't know how that gets there. What we saw in 2011, right before or as this was all coming through, is President Obama and Speaker Boehner had agreed to reforming entitlement on the Medicare and Medicaid side, as well as hiking 800 billion, excuse me, hiking 800 billion dollars worth of taxes. They had fiscal discipline. We had the potential for the super committees, the Simpson Bowles committees. There were ideas thrown out all day long, and the reality was that this Congress could not um, find a way to get to yes on anything practical that would actually dent the deficit. And I'm sorry, 100 billion dollars out of fiscal year 2024 is not going to move the needle in a $33 trillion deficit reduction economy. There's a broader question about when political instability in the U.S. will actually start to matter for markets. And we're asking that with respect to the debt ceiling debate, and we're asking that with respect to the presidential race, where there's more and more uncertainty being piled on with each additional legal case that comes out on both sides of the aisles, the latest being the indictment of the former president uh, for, a genuine, for, for the election and some of his comments around that. Henrietta, when will that start to matter? Um, I, I think what we've seen from the business community is little blips. So, for instance, in the wake of the January 6th insurrection, there was a temporary freeze put on all political fundraising and donations from major corporations, Johnson & Johnson and the like, to, to um, individual members. Um, all of them were from the Republican conference at the time, but that has obviously already gone away, and members are back to pouring in money. Um, groups like the Business Roundtable, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, they're fighting for influence however they can, and that includes spending dollars and giving to campaign donations. So that is a proxy for Wall Street's participation on Capitol Hill, in my opinion, and it has shown no signs of materially changing. Henrietta, wonderful to get your perspective on things. Henrietta Trace there, a VEDA partners down in Washington, D.C. on the latest. This equity market for now is recovering. It was down by something like 1% on the S&P 500. We're negative by 0.44%. Lots of people lining up to say this decision doesn't matter, but also lining up to tell you why they think it doesn't matter. They all want to be heard. So here's Jason Furman. Thank you for this, Jason. At on Twitter. He says this. A year ago, Fitch upgraded the U.S. AAA credit rating outlook from negative to stable, and it set out the criteria for a downgrade. So three points he makes. Three points they made. Significant and sustained rise in the debt to GDP ratio, Jason says, didn't happen. Deterioration in governance quality, hard to see that much has changed. And on the third point, macroeconomic policy performance and prospects, he's making a point, Lisa, much more improved from last year. So based on the criteria they offered for a downgrade last year, what's changed? I would suggest that if you speak to Fitch today, anyone in the media, that's a template to have a conversation with them about what has changed in the last 12 months and what changed for them in the last 24 hours. And I would add that Brad Setzer, formerly of the Treasury Department, put this out on Twitter. Strange timing from Fitch, reiterating that U.S. debt to GDP is heading down. The term premium is negative, talking exactly about the same point. So to that point, if things have actually improved, what is the threshold? Is it just simply because the debt ceiling, once again, was an issue in Washington, D.C., as it has been every single year for years? I'm not saying their views are painted by their politics, but both of those individuals have worked for both the Biden administration and 
for the Obama administration. That's uh, Jason Furman and Brad Setzer, respectively, correct? Yes. OK, just putting that out there, just so you know where those views come from, because there's going to be a lot of political back and forth down in Washington, D.C., about he says, she says, and the blame game's going to continue. Equities on the S&P 500, if you are just tuning in, welcome to the programme. The S&P negative here by 0.45%. Coming up at the 8 a.m. hour, so in about 45 minutes from now, we'll be catching up with Bob Michael of J.P. Morgan Asset Management. Looking forward to that conversation, Lisa, to work out with him what we've been talking about all morning with the likes of Robert Tipp from PGM. OK, we don't care about it. It's justified. It's not justified. Does it matter to markets? Does it actually change anything for the Treasury market this morning that we now have both Fitch and S&P Global Ratings saying you're no longer AAA, you're double A? I also want to hear from him. A lot of the pushback to Fitch mattering has come from people who say the U.S. economy is stronger than it has been. It is not headed toward recession anymore. We've heard that from Bank of America and others. And actually, if anything, we have a better profile. Bob Michael thinks that actually we're heading into a period of weakness. So how could that be sort of underpinning uh, some sort of different call from his perspective, given that he does see weakness and he sees Treasury yields still going down materially to about 3%. That recession call just kind of getting pushed out a little bit. There's much more going on than just this. Let's be clear about that. The ADP report, as Lisa has pointed out, comes out in about one hour from now. That's the appetizer ahead of the main event. The main course on Friday, the payrolls report, and then in between those two big earnings reports that we'll get from the likes of Apple and Amazon in Thursday's session after the close. So a look ahead to all of that with Amy with Silverman of RBC Capital in about 30 minutes from now. In about five minutes, we head back down to Washington, D.C. Need to touch base with AMH on the legal issues of the former president from New York City this morning with equities recovering just a touch. Good morning. centers of the world. Bloomberg Markets European Close with Guy Johnson in London and Alex Steele in New York. Real-time numbers, real-time analysis, weekdays. Bloomberg UK, your source for news and analysis covering the biggest challenges facing the UK government, economy, financial services, and markets. Tax cuts should not be the priority. It's about a credible plan for growth over the next two, three years. In this post-Brexit world, how do you see actually servicing your clients? It was disruptive, and it's going to have implications to how capital raising works. Now we're having the perfect storm in the UK. Watch Francine Lacqua Thursdays at 9.30 a.m. only on Bloomberg, your global business authority. Hoping for slowing job growth, but too much could spell trouble. There is no way that many people would have predicted the kind of data that we've witnessed. Things have slowed down, but they're not falling off a cliff. This Friday, Tom, Jonathan, Lisa, and Mike will bring you crucial data and expert analysis at terminal speed. Which nominal wage growth does the Fed need to see? At what point do people start to say, this is not sustainable? Maybe this will be the turning point. The July Jobs Report, Friday on Bloomberg Television and Radio. Today, an indictment was unsealed, charging Donald J. Trump with conspiring to defraud the United States, conspiring to disenfranchise voters, and conspiring and attempting to obstruct an official proceeding. The attack on our nation's capital on January 6th, 2021, was an unprecedented assault 
the seat of American democracy. As described in the indictment, it was fueled by lies. In this case, my office will seek a speedy trial so that our evidence can be tested in court and judged by a jury of citizens. That was Jack Smith, the U.S. Department of Justice Special Counsel, the third criminal prosecution of the former president as the former president makes another run for the White House. That indictment coming on the same day that we got this poll from Siena College, New York Times, showing 54 percent of likely GOP voters across demographics supporting the former president compared to just 17 percent for his nearest competitor in this upcoming primary for Republicans. So that support is pretty loud and clear. Just going to want to put this out there. Within minutes after the indictment came out, the Trump campaign sent out a fundraising email. And in it, he said, uh, it's not just my freedom on the line, but yours as well, and I will never let them take it from you. It has been used as a fundraising tool, and it has been effective, even though people know that their money is going to simply fight the legal battle. Still with us this morning, I'm pleased to say, AMA Chamory, our chief Washington correspondent. Amory, I'm losing count. Florida. New York, <laughs> Washington, potentially one more still to come. Yes, this is the third indictment the former president is facing. We got the, these charges yesterday, and then there's one more we're waiting on, and this is the Fulton County one in Georgia. Uh, but Fannie Willis, the district attorney there, says she's ready to go. They spent two and a half years on this research, so we can expect that likely before September 1st. That is what she has said publicly. So that would be a fourth indictment for a former president, and we just need to really make it very clear this is not just a former president. This is a candidate for the Republican nomination for 2024. Uh, so this is going to be an election like no other if he does end up becoming the nominee for the GOP. Of these four, Anne-Marie, if you were to rank them, are some much more serious than others? Absolutely. And we spoke to Ty Cobb this week, who served in the White House under Trump. He was part of the White House Council. And he talked about this overwhelming evidence of the document case. And you can see that if you read the charges of the documents case. We also had that superseding indictment last week regarding the documents case in terms of Trump trying to allegedly uh, alter the surveillance video. So there's a lot of hard evidence. This one, as Terry Haynes talked about, is very serious conspiracy to defraud the United States, as well as uh, obstruction of justice and conspiracy against rights. Conspiracy, basically, to say you, your vote does not count. These are incredibly uh, enormous. I can't really uh, uh, express the gravity of these charges, but potentially they are going to be harder to prove, as Terry Haynes said. So I would say these two are the, the top-ranked ones. Georgia follows uh, just below that, because that, as well, would be a charge against trying to defraud voters' rights and the election. And then, of course, there's the hush money case in New York, which many have pretty much shrugged off. And Marie, going forward, there is a real question of when this starts to matter for uh, the election. If President, Trump, if former President Trump is convicted, does any of this potentially eliminate his chance of being president? In other words, does any of this actually matter legally for his ability to rule the nation? Well, we need to see how this plays out in court first off. Uh, the issue would become very difficult for the former president is if there is a charge in a specific state where Trump would not be able to, say he was, because this could take months or years, say he was to become president, hypothetically, if there is a charge in a state, he cannot pardon himself from that state charge. He would have to get a friendly governor to do so. So say, right now, in, in Georgia, that could be the case. But in New York, definitely not. Meanwhile, on the other side, President Biden also uh, coming under fire for his participation uh, reportedly in some calls with his son that had to do with business transactions that he said he wasn't uh, aware of or involved with. How much are people becoming utterly desensitized, or does it matter more on one side than another? Has this just basically become a tribalized election regardless? I think, as John said in the first hour of programming, that there is a little bit of fatigue in the country when it comes to whether it's indictments, whether it's cases against Hunter Biden. Um, sometimes there's so much news coming out of Washington, D.C., it's hard for individuals to really sift through um, all of this. But what you'll see on both sides is they're going to want to talk about the weaponization um, from the Republicans, some of which we'll talk about the weaponization of, Bi they'll call it Biden's Justice Department, given these indictments under Trump are coming under Biden. And then the Republicans will also talk about the fact that as Biden 
basically, uh, they'll say he lied in terms of his business dealings with Hunter Biden. Although we did have the close associate of Hunter Biden testify behind closed doors at a hearing this week at the Oversight Committee in Congress, and Devin Archer basically said, in, uh, in term, according to lawmakers coming out and speaking to individuals um, off record or on background, saying that the president would call, potentially stop into a dinner, but it was really just to say hi to Hunter. It wasn't involved with the business dealings. But this is something that optically will be a problem for the current president as he looks for re-election in 2024. These legal issues that are coming up, Anne-Marie, remind us of the kind of issues we might witness in emerging markets. When Fitch comes out and cites governance issues, do these issues speak to that? Well, this, I think there's a link between these two top stories today. And I say that because if you look back at the report that Fitch put out in June, they talked about political polarization. And they talked about the fact that that has gotten worse since this debate or the, the Trump campaign trying to um, relitigate the 2020 election and the 2020 election interference that the Trump campaign was trying to, one, increase political polarization and partisanship as witnessed by the contested 2020 election. That's what Fitch cited in their June warning. Then we get a downgrade yesterday, moments ahead of the former president being indicted. That is just going to show how much more politicized Washington is and potentially what that means for the reputation and the fiscal health of the U.S. economy. Three weeks away from the first debate. The first debate, Anne-Marie, and we still don't really know who's going to be on that stage. Is the former president going to show up? Have we heard anything in the last couple of days? To be determined if he shows up. Um, I think, I'm sure his lawyers potentially want him to sit this one out. But this is obviously going to get a ton of eyeballs. He's going to be attacked, we know, at least by Governor Chris Christie. We also had a statement yesterday from Vice President Mike Pence, one of his harshest yet, saying that no man is above the Constitution. That person should not be president. He knows he's going to be attacked, so potentially he wants to be there to defend himself and make sure he's part of the show. But we do not have a yes or no yet from the Trump camp on whether or not he will attend that debate in Milwaukee. MH. Thank you. Anne-Marie down in Washington, D.C. We'll no doubt catch up with you a little bit later. Three weeks away, that debate, the first GOP debate. And Lisa, to Anne-Marie's point, we've got a decent idea of how both the former governor of New Jersey, Chris Christie, will deal with these allegations. We've got a decent idea how the former vice president, Mike Pence, is going to deal with this. How's Governor DeSantis going to approach this subject three weeks out? It's been really tough for him because when he has gone against uh, the former president, he's been booed and he's lost support. So how does he go head on while not alienating a lot of the base that does associate themselves with the former president? And this is sort of the push-pull. I personally am more interested to hear about their economic plans. And I feel like this noise is overriding some of the issues that when you actually talk about people's day-to-day -day, matters most to them. Economy, top of the pile. Which is why some people suggest we had that pivot this week from Governor DeSantis, the declaration of economic independence. What was it? We win, they lose. That's basically They're it. They're still trying to work out who the we are and who the they is. I think it was very clearly, I mean, there are a lot of we's and they's, but it's also we being the United States and they being China. That's a big one that you're going to hear more and more China about. China or the rest of the world? Yeah, well, that's going to be another issue. That's a good or question. just China. We'll find out. Yeah. Hopefully we can catch up with the the governor from Florida, ahead of those debates. Equities right now on the S&P, trying to stage a recovery. Negative here by 0.5%. Plenty more coverage on this downgrade from Fitch. We'll catch up with Brian Weiss in the Morgan Stanley Investment Management up next. Live from New York City, good morning.
Knife making is almost meditative for me. There's a lot of passion behind it. There's a lot of hard work behind it. And it's not just something that you kind of just brush off like, oh, this is just a knife. People hands touch this knife. People pour their passion and their soul inside of these products. The art of blacksmithing has a very long history. Our notion of what it means to be civilized is to have metallurgy, to have the ability to transform the natural world. When somebody used my knife, I wanted them to say, damn! <laughs> Golly, this is a badass knife. <laughs> Access the financial world on demand. Hear from leading economists, policymakers, and industry experts via live and on demand webinars only from Bloomberg. Start exploring to see what's moving the markets. Visit Bloomberg.com webinars. and drain the drama out of this situation for you this Wednesday morning. Good morning to you all. Your equity market stays in a bit of a recovery. It's down by 0.4%. Call it down 0.5 on the S&P 500. On the Nasdaq, we're negative by 0.71%, going into an important day for the Nasdaq 100 tomorrow after the close when we hear from Amazon and Apple. The equity market reaction so far pretty contained to the downgrade from Fitch yesterday stripping the United States with AAA credit rating. In the bond market, not much reaction at all. To look at a two-year, 10-year, 30-year, 10 years doing nothing, basically unchanged to down and maybe a basis point to 4.0131%. The two-year yield down by four basis points, so a little bit of a rally there at 486 on a two-year. The move really was yesterday at the longer end of the curve on the 30-year yield higher by, I think, something like eight basis points on a session. 4.0948% is where we are at the moment. Before that downgrade, and I think this is probably the more important piece of information we've had for the bond market in the last 24 hours, came from the Treasury Department, and they've increased their net borrowing estimate for this quarter, July through September, to $1 trillion. That's up from the previous estimate of $733 billion. And those billions matter to this bond market, and they mattered yesterday. In the FX market, I want to finish on the euro, just showing a bit of weakness against the dollar. The dollar a bit stronger to 109.77 on euro dollar, negative a tenth of 1%. The Japanese yen a bit stronger, perhaps speaking to a little bit of risk aversion out there, but really the emphasis here is on a little bit of risk aversion out there at the moment. Under surveillance this morning, Fitch rating, stripping the US of its top tier sovereign credit rating, cutting it from AAA to AA plus in a statement writing this, the rating downgrade of the United States reflects the expected fiscal deterioration over the next three years, a high and growing general government debt burden, and Lisa, this final point, the erosion of governance relative to AA and AAA rated peers. Which, as you've mentioned, is indisputable given all of the discussions around the debt ceiling debate and whether or not we could default. That said, the idea that you're talking about, that 30-year Treasury, and the, the borrowing that we're going to see in about an hour time in terms of how much the U.S. needs to keep borrowing, these stories are interlinked. And it raises a question, even if you could shrug off Fitch, can you shrug off a financial profile that isn't as good when it just comes to the interest expenses and the outright borrowing at a time when who's buying? We know the United States has a special place in our market universe, an exceptional place and arguably by many people, and they'll make this argument irreplaceable. But the governance issues are inconsistent with other peers in the AAA rated bucket. We've talked about Germany. The debt pile is inconsistent with other members of the AAA rated bucket, and we can do a basic assessment of that. The debt to GDP ratio of the United States is north of 100%, and the median of a AAA rated company, or rather AAA rated country, we could talk about companies later, is close to 40%. It's kind of night and day. The argument, though, that a lot of people would say is this has been the case for more than a year. It's not like something has changed. If anything has changed, the debt to GDP has actually come in slightly. You could see that the U.S. economy is on a better trajectory. People are talking about soft landing. So if they were going to do this, 
why now? And I think that increasingly has been the question. The decision to publish that decision came literally moments before this. The former president indicted in Washington on federal charges over his efforts to overturn the 2020 presidential election. Special counsel Jack Smith telling reporters the attack on our nation's capital on January 6th, 2021, was an unprecedented assault on the seat of American democracy. It was fueled by lies lies by the defendant. The charges can carry penalties, of course, of as much as 20 years in prison. The president expected in court, Lisa, on August 3rd. And he is expected uh, to come with a host of lawyers. I still can't get over the fact that within minutes of the indictment, he sent out a fundraising email and that people are viewing this as a rallying call in terms of his supporter base. So it raises a question, what are the legal consequences and what are the political consequences at a time when a lot of people view the state as being politicized and other people are saying, well, if you just look at the nuts and bolts, it looks like this is highly problematic and some serious charges. It's the desensitization that creates some real question marks around what's going to stick. If you want to drown in negativity this morning, it's easy to. Around the US government, super easy. Around the former president, super, super easy. Around the debt profile of America, even easier. Well done, Fitch. <laughs> but I think bottom line is this economy right now, compared to what's happening elsewhere, Germany's just about coming out of recession. Europe's struggling to grow. China's talking about stimulus. And we've got guest after guest dropping their recession call. Mike Gaper of Bank of America with this to say, the recent incoming data has made us reassess our prior view that a mild recession in 2024 is the most likely outcome for the U.S. economy. Growth in economic activity over the past three quarters has averaged 2.3%. The unemployment rate has remained near all-time lows. And wage and price pressures are moving in the right direction, albeit gradually. Now, forgive me if I get too personal and emotional about this. It's easy to trash the politics in America. It's easy to trash the debt in America. Every time I had to go and get a visa before I went and got a green card, there was a line around the building, literally around the building, before the sun even came up. The amount of people lining up still to come into this country, despite its political problems, despite the problem with the debt. This economy right now, just on where we are currently, better than most of the developed world at the moment. And the political situation, I get it. It's incredibly divisive, but people quite literally are lining up to leave their country to move here. And the reason why is because of the economy and the fact that you can make money and the fact that consumers are spending and they're willing to spend on a lot of things and businesses profit from this. I was looking at this yesterday. We talk a lot about consumer spending and how long it can continue. Well, after about a third of U.S. results of U.S. consumer companies, consumer-facing companies, consumer discretionary companies, they have beaten earnings projections by 13 percent versus an average 7 percent across 11 sectors. They are doing better than the others, even though you do have some outliers. So people still spending, and that is leading to profits at a lot of the companies that service them. Now, let's get back to trash in the market. We can do that with Brian Weinstein, head of fixed income <laughs> at Morgan Stanley Investment Management. Brian, good morning to you. Welcome to the program. It's good to catch up again. I just wonder, we've asked this question of many people this morning. I wanted to give you the opportunity to respond to it as well. How did you respond initially when that headline dropped? I mean, I was minding my own business on a quiet summer Friday at my desk, um, and uh, I was surprised. I mean, not surprised. I mean, all the things you guys highlight, we, we've known, right? The discourse is ugly. The amount of spending is is tremendous. It's amazing. It's, it's mind-boggling. Um, and then there's the simple fact, John, as you said, that the U.S. Treasury market is kind of the key to all the markets, so it's not going to be treated differently today than it was yesterday. But I look at the market and go, wait a second, listen to all the, all the good stuff you guys said, too. So you have all the good things happening, plus you have the fact that we have some fiscal and, and maybe political issues. Why are, are people really going to be willing to accept a 4% tenure? It seems so high to us because it's been so low, but do a long-term chart, right? I mean, it seems to me the warning sign here is there's a lot of public debt coming, and you don't really need to chase it. I don't think you're going to miss it. So I was surprised that we didn't sell off more this morning at the end of the day. Brian, what you just said I think is so important. The 10-year yield feels so high because over the last 10 years it's been so low. If you could just erase the history of the last decade or so, Brian, if you could just reset and go through the fundamentals of America and acknowledge that it has this privileged position in our market universe at the very epicenter of it, what do you think the yield should be on a 10-year yeah, I mean, listen, I, I think about this all the time. So if we think that inflation is now going to average higher than 2%, which I think, again, go ahead, do a long-term chart of inflation, 2% target seems low. Um, so I think 
what you really want is you want to think about inflation being, say, two to three. And if growth average is two to three, then 4% is the bottom of your 10-year range, right? Could you have a 10-year range and a four to six, right? Maybe it's a little too tight. Maybe it should be three, it's three to seven or three and a half to, to, to seven and a half. Like, so maybe this is the bottom of a range if you have normal-ish uh, growth and inflation averaging more than two. And by the way, a central bank that doesn't buy all the supply. So I don't think it's crazy to see a 10-year note go another 100 basis points higher from here. Not immediately, but, but over, over time. How much conviction do you have in that, Brian? Are you actually allocating differently and shifting away from duration in response, yeah. not necessarily to Fitch, but the borrowing announcement that we're probably going to get in less than an hour time? There's a lot of borrowing that's going to happen. And so I think the combination of the surprising resilience in the economy, which is important to note, um, and the fact that you are getting good yields in credit, right? If you look at bank loans, if you look at high yield, you can get 8 to 10%. Now, you'll get some defaults in there, so you won't get your full 8 to 10%. But you don't need to take duration risk. So this was the year of the bond, right? And I think the year of the bond was supposed to be not the year of the equity. So it hasn't played out that way. Um, bonds have done fine, right? Bonds have given you the coupon that they promised. I think that's what you should expect from bonds, right? So if we have a short, sell, a, a long-term sell-off, tenure notes move higher over time, you're much better off in non-duration sectors with yields, and i.e. credit, than I think you are just trying to buy duration and hope for you, hoping the yields go back low. So yes, we're, we are investing more and more in that direction. How much has that evolution in terms of an investment thesis happened over the past couple of weeks? I would say, I think I was on with you guys like, um, like six weeks ago, and, and I had believed that we could take a run back towards you know, 3% in 10-year notes, that you could play that recession story. The Fed was was obviously wanting to pause, and here we are. But again, uh, yeah, I think the Fitch thing might be the, the, the final nail in that, in that coffin. But the idea is with stronger growth, with inflation, I think, looking stickier, the next two or three months, it won't look that way. But I think when you go towards the end of the year, you'll see inflation not falling so much on a year-over-year -year basis. It's just the math, right? Um, so it's evolved. Right at the beginning of the year, I was not in a camp that you could see four and a quarter, four and a half um, tenure notes. But but uh, but the last couple of weeks has made me feel like investors should be demanding more premium uh, in a world where inflation is sticky, uh, growth is uh, it seems sticky to um, in a good way, and then you throw in um, some of the uh, fiscal irresponsibility on, on top of it. Um, I, I think it's going to happen. I just think it's a matter of time. Brian, here's a nice exercise for you. Someone somewhere has started to write a speech for Chairman Powell, potentially to deliver at Jackson Hole at the end of August. Brian, if you had to write that speech at the moment and it was going to have some shelf life to deliver at the end of August, what do you think that speech is going to sound like? You know, I, I think he might take a different approach. I think he might not want this one to have shelf life, right? I think this is a, a point in time where the Fed has raised rates a lot. Listen, let's not forget on the other side of raising rates a lot, um, over the next 12 months, there will be impacts, there will be slowdowns. You're seeing it in some of the subprime sectors. Um, you know, you're not seeing it in the broad, broad economy, but it matters. So I, I think the Fed is taking a pause here because they just don't know. And so I, I hate to answer your question, it sounds like a cop out. I think this speech could be boring because the Fed wants to be boring. They I want to let the markets go in some ways if they can engineer a soft landing it's so rare it would be an amazing outcome and so to, to, to really re he might talk about fiscal responsibility and we've seen we've seen federal fed chairman you know take take some steps that he hasn't really yet but i think this speech could be one where we forget about it just to put it on the record i still don't know if he's going to speak in jackson hole wyoming i don't think any of us do yet brian thank you sir for weighing in brian weiss in there of morgan stanley I'm investment management with a an honest assessment of where he thinks this bond market's going to be. I think it's a difficult one for Chairman Powell. Certainly the speech that he's going to deliver, if he does deliver one in late August, is going to be very different to the one he delivered 12 months ago. Are you trying to get him to take August off so that he can set the tone for the rest of Wall Street? Is that what's going on? Because pretty steadily you've raised this sort of suspicion. Maybe he's not going to show up. He's just going to stay on vacation, which nobody has said. I'm suggesting there's not much to say right now. I would agree Between with that. Between the last meeting and the next one, there's two CPI prints, two payrolls reports, one of which we get on Friday. Why say anything at all? Just wait for those two to come in, let the market move based on what the incoming information is and make a move in September if you need to. The one thing he could say is the importance in getting back to 2% with speed, right? Does it matter that it's going to take until 2025 to get inflation back to the level that they're looking for? If you are just joining the program, welcome to the program on the S&P 500. We're negative here by 0.5%. Coming up shortly, 8.30 Eastern time, we'll catch up with Ron Arnott of Research Affiliates. Before we get to Rob, I've got a great lineup for you. So Amy Wu Silverman of RBC Capital Markets on the way this equity market is set up, going into some big earnings reports starting tomorrow from Apple and Amazon. And then in the 8 o'clock hour, so starting at about 18 minutes from now, on the bond market, Bob Michael of JP Morgan Asset Management, Nathan Sheets 
of Citigroup, formerly, of course, of PGM as well. And somewhere in between, you get an ADP report, so we'll catch up with Mike McKee. And for those of you with a decent memory, don't think you need that good a memory, about a month ago, we had an ADP report which had a blowout number and completely changed the conversation going into payrolls Friday. So we'll see what we get in about 30 minutes from now. That's why I say it always matters until it doesn't it's matter. Away. No one cares and, about ADP yeah. until the second after it drops and it's a surprise. But if we're data dependent, when does the data matter? Do we take some sort of signal from the jolts data that we got yesterday, or do people just shrug it off and say this is noisy uh, and it really is backward looking? I mean, it seems like choose your own narrative, but people are in a narrative shift moment. It feels like there is something and a reassessment happening in the past couple of days. People want new narratives to come to life all at once. The fact of the matter is we're in this process where job openings are coming down. Lending standards have tightened in response to the increases we've had from the Federal Reserve over the past year, and you've seen that pretty continuously now over the last couple of months, the last few quarters. But nobody is collapsing, so nobody cares Precisely. until they do. And that's sort of the issue. We're seeing that shift slowly grind its way into certain parts of the market. Hasn't made a dent in employment, let's put it that way. Unemployment still expected to come in on Friday in at around 3.5% or so, 3.6% to be precise, I think. Your equity market recovering, well off session lows on the S&P 500, negative by 0.47%. From New York, this is Bloomberg. on at the moment is how do we charge back into Ukraine as soon as uh, the European authorities say it's safe to fly in Ukraine again. Now, nobody knows when that is going to be. But we were Ukraine's second largest airline when the Russians invaded on the 24th of February last year. We would be Ukraine's biggest airline the week after they tell us it's safe to go back in there because we're going to charge back in there. Initially, we have a plan to open up about 30 routes from four Ukrainian airports back into the European Union. And then we want to, I think, in the first within six to 12 months, open up three or four large bases in Ukraine. And we're talking to the Ukrainian authorities about creating an environment cost agreement on which we could lead the charge of air travel uh, into a post-war Ukrainian recovery. This Friday, Wall Street Week comes to you from Colorado. Join David Weston for the 2023 Aspen Economic Strategy Group meeting. Special guests Cecilia Rouse, Rafael Bostic, Brian Moynihan, David Cody, Austin Goolsby, and Larry Summers join David Weston for exclusive conversations on persistent inflation, rising debt, and demographic challenges in the U.S. and around the world. It's a Wall Street week you won't want to miss. This Friday at 6 p.m. Eastern, only on Bloomberg Television and Radio. Slice through the noise. Forget the noise, ignore the noise. Is this just going to be noise? Just noise. It's noise versus signal. Now more to the point. What is the lesson or the observation? Why do the biggest names in business choose Bloomberg? That is a great question. It's a great question. Great question. Great question. Best question I get all night. Bloomberg. Top experts. Great questions. I was thinking about this last night, the differences between this downgrade yesterday and it's actually, I think, August 5th of 2011 was the downgrade. The yield setup was actually very different. Yields were falling into the 2011 downgrade. Yields were in a downtrend. We kind of have a saying, surprises always break in the direction of the trend. And the trend in yield is up right now. That was Chris Verone a little bit earlier on this morning, the partner and head of technical macro strategy at Strategus. Special thanks to Robert Burgess of Bloomberg for, I would say, inspiring this exercise to look back on August 5th, 2011, and take a look at what's happened with markets cross asset ever since then. All the doom and gloom you heard back then about America's position in financial markets, about what would happen to the US dollar. The dollar index since then, DXY, has advanced about 40%. And US capital markets, US dollar denominated financial markets have outperformed the rest of the world in a big way, particularly against places like Europe. Of course, the compare and contrast back in 2011 was Europe was drowning in a Eurozone debt crisis. The growth backdrop, we were talking about double dips here, there, and all over the place. And now we're talking about pretty robust growth in America this morning. Which raises the question, what's the alternative and what is the haven that could replace the U.S.? And you brought this up earlier. I think it's increasingly important to really think about if people are saying this is a concern with the U.S. debt increasing and the borrowing increasing so significantly. I mentioned that one guest that we caught up with, that one source, I think, down in Australia, what does replace it? 
Japanese government bonds when Bitcoin. the BOJ owns half the market, the European debt market, we know that mess over the last 10 years or so. What replaces it? Bitcoin, evidently, and Apple and Amazon. Is <laughs> that sort of what people have done is basically say, look. It doesn't have the depth. Yeah, it doesn't have the depth. No, nothing can replace it, and that's what everybody is saying. Joining us now, I'm pleased to say, on the equity market, away from bonds for a moment, A.B. Wolf Silverman, the head of derivative strategy at RBC Capital Markets. There's this great line in your note, Amy, just allow me to share that with our audience. There is a reluctance to be the strategist who cried low vol. Amy, just explain what you mean by that. Yeah, you know, look, we have been telling folks for a while now that when you look at the cost of hedging, over a decade, we're really at historical lows. So, you know, an S&P or Q put that struck 5% out of the money, John, these are trading at historical lows now. But the problem is, you know, low vol often begets low vol the same way positive momentum begets momentum. So you don't want to be the strategist who cried low vol, but still, you know, it's just really important to highlight how inexpensive these hedging costs have gotten in the face of kind of this huge sentiment shift into something more positive. I mean, when you say that low vol can beget low vol, are we seeing that develop currently? Is that what you're seeing? We are. And, you know, to some degree, it's a little concerning because there are these time frames where low vol begets low vol, which begets low vol until it doesn't. So 2011, which I know you guys have been talking about in the context of the last debt ceiling, uh, or 2018 for us in the derivatives world, which which led to Volmageddon, you know, it doesn't mean it necessarily hearkens these events, but oftentimes these low volatility cycles does beget uh, kind of a gap down at some point to higher volatility regimes. Does it feel, based on the metrics that you look at, that we're at a tipping point, a narrative shift, a point at which the higher Treasury yields and some of the jitters that we're seeing in certain corners are starting to percolate out into uh, the way people are shifting? You know, not yet, Lisa. Maybe that changes a little because the downgrade news for the U.S. is relatively fresh. But I will tell you, when you look to earnings, when you look to single stock volatility, it's sort of exuberance all around. And that has really been true where, you know, to Tom's favorite word, the skew of the market has leaned much more to the call side. And that's part of this low volatility situation you're seeing, which is there's just been much more demand for upside. And a lot of that has to do with the relative lack of positioning we saw that caught people off sides, that created FOMO. And there are still folks who need to dive in the pool. You know, that's how I would characterize the options market right now. How important will the earnings that we get tomorrow of Amazon and Apple be in shaping some of that optimism? Have earnings confirmed the optimism and this feeling of FOMO that everyone seems to be expressing? Yes, I think it has. And, and I think the two earnings we'll get tomorrow, which is, you know, kind of 20% of waiting will be very important. What's interesting for Amazon and Apple is you're actually seeing a divergence here. So Amazon's call skew is actually very high, meaning, you know, there's a good deal of bullish sentiment. That's actually not true in Apple, which is also very different than the other mega cap techs we saw. So I'll be interested to see how that plays out because you're actually seeing on those two stocks a divergence in that option sentiment positioning going into earnings. Amy, can we just finish up by maybe thinking about what's developed in the last 12 hours from Fitch and the downgrade of the U.S. government credit rating from AAA to AA+. From someone in your seat, do you consider governance issues, political dislocations, the disputes, the division down in D.C. as a source for volatility or something to ignore? I think it absolutely is. And one thing I'll say, John, is the options market in general is absolutely terrible at pricing political and geopolitical events. It just it just really is bad at handicapping it. And you saw that in 2011. So if we go back to that debt ceiling, we had a VIX spike at 40. And part of it was just this inability to handicap how situations like these play out. So right now, I would say the market is sort of nodding this off. I don't know if that changes down the line, but historically, you know, the options market tends to be the worst at pricing events that are not catalyst driven, but much more of these political overhangs. People are talking about the election next year and how much of an overhang that could be introducing potential volatility. Is that something that you're expecting or seeing anything related to? Or for now, is it basically all about the earnings, all about the economy and not at all about drama that people have gotten desensitized to? Yeah, you know, look, I actually think investors really should be 
focusing on that because it's sort of this tie into what needs to happen this year because it likely wouldn't happen next year. But, you know, one thing that's structurally happened in the options market is we've gotten much more short term. That's partly related to the rise of zero DTE trading, just the tenor reduction overall to manage these data events. But the options market, which was short term to begin with, has gotten even more short term while I would say the long term risks have risen when you look out to 2024. Amy, great to get your input and some insight from you on the latest in DC and beyond. Amy was Silverman there of RBC Capital Markets, responded to that downgrade from Fitch yesterday afternoon, looking ahead to those earnings from Apple and Amazon after the close on Thursday. Looking ahead to this program, getting the likes of Bob Michael at JP Morgan Asset Management to respond to the latest developments in this bond market, the Treasury issuance we can expect through this quarter and beyond, and where he thinks this Treasury market should be. Not so long ago, he was looking for a real slowdown in this economy, imminent rate cuts, and yields drop into 3% right across the curve, two-year, 10-year, 30-year, twos out to 30s, 3.00%. So we'll get the latest from Bob. The compare and contrast from City this morning, pretty clear. On the downgrade, just one line from Andrew Hollenhorst, we expect no market reaction. Here's the bulk of the piece. 10-year Treasury yields are back above 4%. 30-year yields are at the highs of the year for 2023. The move higher in long-term yields anticipates a solid jobs number on Friday, which would highlight the resilience of the U.S. economy. Wait for this. Their estimates for Friday payrolls, 290,000. Consensus right now, 200K. Lisa, Andrew and the team looking for 290. And as we heard from Amy with Silverman and many other people, if you look at the earnings, they confirm the strength. You hear about hiring on the margins, even as a number of companies still prune. But they've been paring back. The layoffs already happened, and a lot of companies have shown a reluctance to cut further because of their experience during the pandemic. So if we get that kind of number, is that a catalytic event? Or are people just so basically drilled into this feeling that you get a soft landing, you get yields coming in, you get inflation coming in, and you can keep chugging along without the pain that we heard about a year ago? We hope we can do that. Look, when inflation's threatening to go through double digits... You can make the argument maybe that higher unemployment is a, a price worth paying to get inflation down. And of course, I've always said this, it's easy to say when it's not your job on the line and you're the chairman of the Federal Reserve and you've got a guaranteed term. When inflation's down to, say, 3 and unemployment's still 3.5%, can you make the argument that juice is worth the squeeze, that higher unemployment is worth that 100 basis points lower in CPI? Is that something you're fully committed to? That's exactly why what Brian Weinstein over at Morgan Stanley, what he said was fascinating to me, saying that in the past couple of weeks, he's thinking more about that reality, not getting back down to 2%, could it going more to 3%. And that means that 4% is the bottom of the range for yields for 10-year treasuries. That is a game changer for the entire risk reward spectrum. And so have people game that out. I'm very curious to hear what Bob Michael has to say about that. Actually. Alarian's been great on that, yeah. about maybe tolerating a higher inflation a higher inflation rate, and many people have pushed back against it. I would also say that PIMCO's Rich Clarit are talking about tolerating two points something in a secular outlook, a key feature of their work over the last few months as well. So if you're just tuning in, this is how the stage is set through the rest of this morning. In about 20 minutes, we'll get the ADP report. So a jobs report from ADP ahead of the real one, the headline one, on Friday, the official payrolls report. We're looking for a decent number on Friday, 200K. Mike McKee's going to break down that ADP report. Bob Michael's going to be sat in that seat just there from JP Morgan breaking down this bond market. Your equity market's doing OK. It was much lower than this a little bit earlier. The the S&P 500 is negative by 0.5%. Live from New York, this is Bloomberg. Julie Swinehart is supremely skilled at navigating the rapids of real estate. That's important because real estate development is the next frontier in the business of sports. Fenway Sports Group has a blockbuster project in the works. We have five acres to play with here. And when all is said and done, we expect two million square feet across residential, commercial, retail. Given the track record of Messrs. Henry, Werner, and Gordon, the Fenway Corners plan comes with high hopes of success. That doesn't mean it will be an easy lift, especially right now. What have you learned with the dynamic move of the interest rates? Do you go fixed structure or floating structure? Much more like what they do in Europe. Yes and yes. We, uh, we have a mix currently. Uh, it's a little bit of a different model than, mm -hmm. than what I was used to in the public, public company space. Say in, in some ways it, we provide ourselves with a natural hedge, leaving some uh, of our debt floating and some fixed. Julie Swinehart took me on a walking tour into the future. 
This is going to become the true entrance to Fenway Park. And that's part of the attractiveness of this project is the age old recipe of increasing dwell times, bringing fans to the park, bringing in businesses, maintaining what's here and preserving right. some of the historic nature of what you see around you, but making it even more accessible, making it more fan friendly. The names that move markets are on Bloomberg. China has seen slower growth than they expected. Many countries do depend on strong Chinese growth to promote growth in their own economies. For the United States, growth is slowed, but our labor market continues to be quite strong. I don't expect a recession. I think we're in a good path. Nobody covers business like Bloomberg, your global business authority. thing in life I've often said is to be happy, but you seem like a very happy person. It's like nature. Nothing ever stops. So you could be super happy one minute and then something happens. So it's just, it's just living. It's the joy of life. For any young woman that's watching this, wants to be the next Diane von Furstenberg, what would you recommend? I think the most important thing in life is the relationship you have with yourself. Once you have a good relationship with yourself, any other relationship is a plus and not a must. And the second advice is to be as true to yourself as you possibly can. And you have to accept and own things you may not like, but the more you could be you, the happier you will be. On the next episode of The Circuit, I was like, this is a way to change culture. Like, what a different world. Of course, we know for girls, it means so much to have female athletes to look up to. But for boys to look up to women also, it's really for everyone. Watch The Circuit with Emily Chang Thursdays, 10 p.m. Eastern on Bloomberg Television or 8 p.m. Eastern on Bloomberg.com or the Bloomberg app on connected TVs. Fixed Income Fix. Watch Bloomberg Real Yield every Friday at 1 p.m. Eastern, right here on Bloomberg, your global business authority. It's never good when a rating agency says, okay, we don't like your debt as much as we used to. Clearly, it's not good news, but if we look at the initial market reaction, pretty moderate reaction in the bond market. No country that has the strength of the U.S. is going to be affected. The main question is, does this compromise the reserve currency status yes. of the U.S. dollar? I have learned very painfully that one never wants to forecast the demise of the dollar. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. A collective shrug of the shoulders on Wall Street this morning. Secretary Yellen calling the move arbitrary, outdated. Mohamed Alarian labeled the downgrade a strange move. Larry Summers said he can't imagine any serious analyst giving the decision weight. That decision to strip America of its AAA credit rating. Fitch, the latest, more than 10 years, more than a decade, after we saw the same thing from S&P Global Ratings. Lisa, they gave three reasons. We've gone through those reasons all morning. If you are just tuning in, welcome. We can do it again if you wish. It reflects the expected fiscal deterioration, a high and growing general government debt burden, the erosion of, of governance, those three issues, topics we've been talking about for more than a decade now. And this from Peter Scheer of Academy Securities just moments ago. No one buys treasuries because of the rating. And what he talked about were all the same issues, including some of the debt ceiling debates and the lack of agreement in Washington. But he said, why do people buy the assets of the U.S.? Not the ability to tax, but the value of the land and things like drilling rights. And that, I think, is what people are really demonstrating this morning. Well said, Peter Chair. We can talk lots about the political fallout. Let's talk about the market fallout and how limited it is. Check out the markets right now. Equity futures are down by something like 0.5%. For now, let's see if that changes. In the bond market, no movement at all. You'd have no idea anything happened. Your 10-year yield, 4.02% on a 10-year at the moment, totally unchanged. The euro against the dollar, totally unchanged. The data... Arguably, potentially more important for now, not over the next 5, 10, 20 years, but for now, the data more important for many. And that data, Lisa, comes in about 13 minutes. Which data? And this, I think, will be the key question going forward in a couple of in the next couple of months. You're talking about ADP and the employment report from them. The latest read on whether there is pain or whether there still is strength. 
At 8.30, there is another bit of data from the Treasury Department talking about how much money they're going to have to borrow in this quarter, and it's expected to be almost $275 billion more than previously expected. This plays into the Fitch point, but it's having a more direct impact potentially on markets, and that, I think, is worth paying attention to. The estimate for borrowing this quarter, July out to September, has gone from 7.33 to $1 trillion. So when Secretary Yellen calls the decision to downgrade the debt both arbitrary and outdated, that's probably a conversation we need to have right now. AMH joins us from Washington, our chief Washington correspondent. Amory, wonderful to have you back with us in the program. We know the political back and forth, the fallout, the blame game. Can you pick up on what Secretary Yellen's got to say about this decision? Well, as you said, Jonathan, she's calling it outdated, arbitrary. When she spoke to me recently, she was even talking about how optimistic she is regarding the U.S. economy as it is coming out of the pandemic. She pointed to a very strong labor market and the fact that she does not see a recession on the horizon, something that Fitch potentially, though, d uh, disagrees with her. They still have that potential in there. Um, I think it was interesting talking to Libby Cantrell yesterday of PIMCO. What she says that she has heard from clients um, around the world when they look at the U.S. economy and where to invest and how they are viewing um, the economic um, resurgence following the pandemic, what she said is that that the U.S. is the cleanest of the dirtiest shirts, meaning everyone is dealing with economic problems, but still, individuals, global investors, still want to put their money in America. And marie yesterday we got the one-two punch of both the Fitch downgrade of the U.S. rating, and then we got the announcement of the indictment of the former President Trump. Are these two stories linked in any way? I do think they're linked if you look back at why Fitch, the crux of why Fitch is really coming out with this downgrade now. It comes at a time when they put Washington on watch, and in June, in a report, they talked about the political polarization that is happening in Washington, D.C., and they specifically, I'm looking at the report now, point to this um, 2020 election in terms of the Trump administration trying to overturn the 2020 election results, something that Trump was indicted for just yesterday. And within moments of Fitch coming out with that result, to be honest, we were all uh, on the edge of our seats waiting to see what the charges would be. We knew that special counsel Jack Smith was going to announce something. Trump himself came out and said it would be at 5 p.m. It was a bit after that. We got the Trump Truth Social saying he's about to be indicted, and then Fitch downgraded the U.S. credit rating, and then we got the charges against the former president, which go to the crux of the matter of the 2020 election uh, conspiracy, as well as why you are seeing this political polarization. Because this indictment against Trump is obviously going to be very political, because this is not just a former president. This is a candidate to be the nominee for the presidential election of November of 2024 for the Republican Party. Can we just go through the timeline, Anne-Marie, just briefly? What are you expecting to hear from the former president? Well, he can truth social at any moment. His lawyer um, has been out and about on all the major networks this morning. We heard him on the Today Show speaking with Savannah Guthrie, talking about the fact that it's the defendant that has a right to a speedy trial because Jack Smith said yesterday he wants a speedy trial, but that they want to take their time. He said the Department of Justice, he actually called it Biden's Department of Justice, they are really trying to say that this is political, um, had three years to investigate this, and they want to take their time. So this is going to take months and years. The most imminent date to watch is going to be tomorrow, and that's when Trump will be arraigned. And we just don't know yet whether or not he is going to come in person to Washington, D.C., or if he'll be arraigned over Zoom, because that is a possibility. Anne-Marie, thank you. MH down in Washington, D.C., with the timeline for Washington and the events in the nation's capital. Here's the timeline for Wall Street this morning. In about nine minutes, we'll get the ADP report. The estimate is 190,000. The previous number, I'm sure some of you remember this number, 497,000, close to 500K. Of course, payrolls came in at 209,000 the following Friday after that report. The estimate for Friday in the payrolls report is 200K. Bob Michael of J.P. Morgan Asset Management joins us around the table here in New York to go through some of this. Bob, good morning. Good morning. What a morning already, going yeah, to the ADP report. Let's start with that downgrade. I just wonder from your perspective, and we've asked so many people this question, does it matter to you personally? You hold a lot of this stuff. Does it change anything? 
Well, that's the question we asked ourselves last night, and we wanted to confirm a number of things. The first thing we did is go through all our client portfolios and made sure that the guidelines exempted treasuries from any kind of ratings. Um, they all do. We went through that exercise in 2011. Then we looked at treasuries in the market. We confirmed that they're still exempt from SEC registration, and they still maintain a zero risk weighting in terms of bank capital and liquidity considerations. Then they're also very important in the collateral management market. <clears throat> and we just confirmed that the CFTC and the CME do not reference rating agencies. They only reference U.S. Treasuries. So we wanted to make sure the markets would remain stable. We're confident they would. I think the next thing we're looking for is what does Fitch do with the GSEs? What do they do with the mortgage market? Do they say because it's securitized, it has a higher rating than the sovereign? I don't know. I'm anxious to see what they do there. Okay, so for the same things, the same reasons you went through point by point and said that ultimately this downgrade doesn't matter, would the downgrades off the back of it matter? Would they have consequences? Elsewhere, have we got downgrades because of those reasons elsewhere? I, I don't think so. And, and we go back to what did Fitch do? And you have to go back to May when they put it on watch. That was a pretty clear signal that in no reasonable period of time would the U.S. be able to get its fiscal deficits, debt to GDP, or how the governance process works into line with what are the nine other remaining AAA-rated sovereigns. And if you go through them one by one and look at debt to GDP, the U.S. is headed to 120 percent. The median of the other nine AAA-rated Fitch sovereigns is 39 percent. You look at fiscal deficits, the U.S. is going to run minus 6 to minus 7 percent. Zero is the median of the other nine AAA sovereigns. So you're miles away. I won't touch governance. I think I heard uh, what Anne Marie said. I think said. that's down, been down with already this morning, Bob. Yeah. Do you know what? We have a lot of clients who love the U.S. markets, love U.S. Ass assets because of the rule of law and the governance. They like the transparency. They like to see the battles on the floor. So then there's a question of just how strong the U.S. economy is, because what a lot of people have pushed back against the Fitch downgrade as saying the U.S. economy is actually increasing and the momentum is just developing. You haven't been saying that. You've been seeing a recession. So do you take that argument that the U.S. is arguably in a stronger position or do you kind of push back on that? Well, the, the one that stands out is modeling the fiscal deficit to unemployment. And with unemployment at 3.4%, you wouldn't expect the U.S. to need to run a fiscal deficit of 6 to 7%. But for us, unemployment is a lagging indicator. Unemployment is confirmation that we're not in recession or confirmation that we are in recession. The high in unemployment is generally a couple quarters after the recession, and the low is generally a couple quarters before recession. We th still think we're headed for recession sometime around year end. And until we're in a recession, unemployment will, yes, remain low. Something we were talking about with Brian Weinstein, and I know that uh, John's been talking about with a number of guests, including Mohammed El Arian, has been that the Fed may allow inflation to go down to just 3% or 2.5% or something like that, and then stop there with respect to how high they're willing to hold rates. And Brian Weinstein was saying that in that case, you look at 4% as a floor for 10-year treasuries. Why do you not see that as a likelihood? So uh, this brings back flexible av average inflation targeting. Go back to 2019. Makes sense for me because I wondered if targeting 2% inflation exposes you too much to the 1 1.6, 1 1.7, 1 1.8s, which we've learned is too low for an economy, the complexity and size of the U.S. economy. So I'm all for this sort of two and a quarter, maybe up to 2.4%. That said, what people are now saying is we hit CPI, 9%, other measures, you know, high single digits, the, the Fed has thrown an array of policies at it. And you're now in a disinflationary trend, but disinflation will be transitory, that it's coming down like a ski slope. 
and it will stop at 2.5%. I don't believe that. I think the policies are in place. The long and variable lags are biting. They will hit. People talk about employment. No one's really talked about the ISM employment component. It was 44.4. It's never been at that level without the Fed cutting rates. So throw that in the basket of things that has a perfect track record of the U.S. economy is either in recession, headed to recession, or the Fed should be cutting rates. I don't think you can dismiss all of those things. You talked about the lags. Did you read the Bill Dudley piece on the Bloomberg Terminal yesterday? I'll share the quote with you at home. Bill Dudley said this, the former New York Fed president, there's considerable evidence that the lags have shortened, meaning that the economy has already found nearly all of the impact of the Fed's actions. What's the argument against that? Businesses and households have locked in a lot of low-cost funding over the last couple years. That's why the supply of housing on the market isn't there. That's why when you look at corporate fundamentals, businesses have locked in very low cost of funding. Those things will change as the quarters roll by. Things will need to be refinanced. There will be more borrowing that's put in place. Yes, consumers may have locked in 25 to 3% mortgages, but what's alarming to us is the amount of revolving credit that's been put in place. You look at credit card usage, it's up like that. And that's in the 20% sphere. So consumers are struggling to pay higher prices now. They've tapped out their excess savings. They're on their credit card. We'll see where it all ends up. You're going to stick with us, I hope, after we break this number. The ADP report out in about 60 seconds' time. The estimate is 190,000. The previous number is 500K. Before that number breaks and I cross over to Mike McKee, when do you expect the weakness to turn up in the labor market if we still believe in these long and variable lags? Is that a story for later this summer, later this year, or early 2024? I, I think we'll see it before the end of the year. I think we'll see it over the next several months. That jobs report on Friday, the estimate for Friday is that we won't see it on Friday. That's the estimate in our survey. Moving target, of course, I always say that. We get new estimates. Up, estimates get upgraded, updated, downgraded. At the moment, the median estimate is 200,000. The previous read there was 209. If you are just tuning in, welcome to the program. Just extending this segment to catch up with Bob and break down these job numbers. Going into the job numbers, the equity market looks like this on the S&P 500, down by about 0.5% on the S&P. Yields aren't doing much at all. The 10-year at 4.0171 percent downgrade what downgrade with the economic data is mike mckee <laughs> good morning john well this is the uh, most important least important data of the month and it comes in 324,000, which is a lot bigger than the 190,000 that had been anticipated however uh the previous month 497 uh, we'll have to see if that's revised was uh, much higher than the uh, government reported on Friday right now it looks like uh, the big change in goods producing comes in natural resources and mining as manufacturing lost 36,000 jobs ADP says the, they said they had lost a lot of jobs last month and that hadn't happened service providers add 303,000 and of those 201,000 are in that leisure and hospital hospitality uh, group that we like so much. Uh, 237,000 jobs in small establishments, 138,000 medium and large establishments, large businesses lost 67,000 jobs, they say. And finally, we get the uh, pay change numbers from ADP. Job stayers saw their uh, pay increase by 6.2%. Job changers saw theirs increase by 10.2%. And those are numbers, those numbers are down from previous month, so that does look like uh, perhaps some good news for the Fed. Uh, they do pay attention to some of that. And you know what's really interesting is the Fed gets these ADP raw data, and they have their own model that they make out of it, uh, and it doesn't seem to match up with what we get. But uh, at this point, uh, ADP suggesting a stronger than expected July payrolls number coming Friday. Mike McKee, stay close, buddy. As always, upside surprise on ADP. It doesn't matter. And then a 
It does. 324 is the number. The estimate was 190. The previous was that blowout, 497. In response to that, there was a rally at the front end of the curve. We've given that up. Yields are now unchanged on a two-year at about 489. Unchanged on the session, yields were lower by something like three or four basis points. We're down now by only one. The 10-year not doing much. In the FX market, the dollar showing just a touch more strength, not a major move. 109.75 on the euro against the dollar. And equities haven't really moved at all in response to this. We're still negative by 0.5%. Alongside Lisa, I'm Jonathan Ferro. Joining us is Bob Michael and Nathan Sheets. Nathan Sheets of City, Bob Michael of JP Morgan Asset Management. Bob, you've had a chance to go through that number. 324, ADP, doesn't matter, doesn't matter, doesn't matter. Then you get a number like that. Does it matter? It, it fell within my range of expectation for ADP of minus 500,000 to <laughs> plus 500,000. No, it's proven it doesn't matter. I'm looking for the employment report on Friday, and I'm specifically looking for hours worked. That's super helpful. Do you want to stick around? <laughs> sure. Great. Nathan Sheets, great to have you with us on the program, Peter. Nathan. Your thoughts on that jobs number going into Friday. You guys are looking for a big one Friday, right? 290? Yeah, we're at, we're at 290. I think uh, part of, uh, part of uh, 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 upside on it is a seasonal adjustment issue. But I think that underneath that, the real narrative is we continue to see the U.S. labor market as being very strong and buoyant. And I think the underlying driver of that is the U.S. consumer spending on services remains very strong. And services are labor intensive, and that has uh, supported employment for the last uh, 18 months or so. And we think that story continues. So what do you make of what Bob Michael was just talking about, the ISM component of the manufacturing survey showing a real deterioration in the employment? There does seem to be on the margin signs that not all is right. Yeah, see, the flip side of the strength in services has been weakness in the manufacturing and the goods sectors. We're uh, in the midst of a rebalance and rotation in, uh, in spending uh, towards services. That's been ongoing now for a while, but it seems like it continues. So uh, for me, one of the puzzles has been, as the good sectors have softened to the extent that they have, that we haven't seen a little bit more kind of shedding of labor in the manufacturing sector. Uh, and I pointed to that as an example of labor hoarding. Well, maybe we're now getting to a point where some of those firms are saying, well, given where we are and the pressures that we're facing, we're going to have to let some workers go. Or to minimum, we're not going to be able to hire quite as much as we have in the past. Well, and how quickly could this turn? I mean, that's one of the big debates. Could this just fall off a cliff? This is, this is a very important question. And I think when you look at labor market dynamics and you look at the unemployment rate, going into recessions, the unemployment rate is usually pretty flat. And then it moves in a sharp kind of V-shape. And it doesn't send invitations beforehand, say, I'm getting ready to go. It just goes. So I think these dynamics could be uh, quite abrupt. Bob Michael is just like me. He can't hide it. He wants to jump in. I can feel it. But what have you got to say? <laughs> what, what a wonderful comment. Nathan's exactly right. And I've said it <clears throat> many times. The low in unemployment is before recession. It's confirmation that you're not in recession. I understand that, sh that spending patterns on the consumer have shifted from goods to services. But how long can that continue with credit card borrowing going vertical and with excess savings being burned up. The key metric we're looking at is, is the savings rate, and uh, the savings rate remains uh, low by historical uh, metrics. It's running around 4.5%. Another prism into this is the quote-unquote excess savings, and by our reckoning, there's still some. But it really boils down to the question of, when is that savings rate going to normalize? And as all I know is that for the last few quarters, it's been pretty stable at around 4.5%. And that makes me think this thing could continue, and particularly the strength in services spending, could continue for maybe a couple more quarters. Maybe there'll be another discussion in early 2024, but through the end of this year, things are looking pretty solid. Well, has that dovetail then, Nathan, into this idea of some spike in unemployment and this sort of hard landing type of narrative that has been all but taken off the table? Right. So on the one hand, we've had the labor hoarding, in my view, in the manufacturing sector. Maybe some of that's starting to give. But I think that we need to see some easing in, in services spending, a rise in the overall uh, savings rate. I think we will see that, but it's more likely to be an early 2024 story. 
And there's more uncertainty around it. I mean, many of our competitors are shifting their uh, macro calls away from recession in early 2024 to soft landing. You know, based on history and the tightness of the labor market and some of the imbalances in the economy, we're not there. We still think that there will be a recession next year. But boy, uh, this is a very, very finely balanced call between soft landing and recession during 2020. Well, let's talk about the Federal Reserve calls between you both. Bob, going into the summer, you were calling for rate cuts potentially as soon as September. Where are you now on that call on Fed policy? Uh, we think this is going to be closer to 1981, where the Fed didn't start cutting rates until right on the doorstep of recession. So if we're right, recession happens sometime right around year end, that's when the first rate cut should be. So no no rate cuts in September. So there's a bit of disagreement between you both. But when it comes to the Fed, I imagine you're only a few months apart. Rate cuts in potentially the turn of the year. Where have you got rate cuts? We, we've got them in Q2. So there we go. So we're arguing over six months here? Broadly, I'd say broadly speaking. Now, where it gets a little trickier is if we're wrong and there isn't a recession and we're looking at a soft landing, I think a feature of a soft landing scenario that is not getting enough attention is it means the rates are going to be higher for longer. That recession is going to open the door if, if and when it occurs to more aggressive Fed rate cuts. If we don't get it, it's going to be a gradual glide down in the Fed funds rate in coming years. When you say that rate cuts are going to happen, does that happen well before inflation rates are south of 3%? I think that in, in engaging inflation, it's really important to be looking at those monthly prints and thinking about them. And I think that it will happen uh, in our forecast, kind of in the second part of a two-quarter recession. And by that point, the Fed will be fairly confident that inflation is moving down sustainably into the two, two and a half percent range. Bob, I wanted to give you the final word because I think the kind of things you're talking about in the long term aren't getting enough attention. Do you still have the view that we've broken out of this world of rate hiking cycles, rate cutting cycles, going from lower lows to higher highs? Are we making that shift? Are we leaving the third last 30 years behind? And as we go forward from here, never mind this cycle, but the next one, the one after that, are we going to a world of higher lows and higher highs in each rate cutting, rate hiking cycle? Yeah, absolutely. The last 20 years look to be the anomaly to us. We think we'll go back to something that looks more normal. I like to tell clients, go to that first dot back in 2012. The median long-term estimate of neutral Fed funds was four and a quarter percent. Makes a lot of sense to me. You're targeting 2% inflation over its history. To that point, the real Fed funds rate had been two and a quarter percent. Slap the two together. There you go. There's a real cost to borrowing and spending. That's an active, vibrant economy. We think we're surely headed back to that, but the path may be zero to five and a quarter, five and a half, then back to somewhere around two and a half to three percent, and next time maybe, you know, up to six percent, and then back to four, four and a quarter percent. Big changes, Bramo, potentially. What this means to me is that the market's going to get less and less interest rate sensitive because everyone will just wait until things go back down to zero to refinance for 30 years. So it'll mean that nobody has any interest rate sensitivity whatsoever. We're well, going from zero to three and then from three to five over time will make a difference, right? It should, but this is the sort of question. At what point does that volatility render it completely unuseful in terms of a tool to really control inflation? Bob, this was great. It's good to see you. Bob Pleasure. Michael, thank you, sir. And to you as well, Nathan. Just awesome. Thanks for dropping by on the latest ADP report. That number, 324,000. The previous number, 497. The estimate, 190. Payroll's coming up on Friday. Coming up on the open in about 25 minutes from now, Mo Hagbin of Invesco, Chris Mamani of Lafayette College, Laurie Calvacina of RBC Capital Markets from New York City. Good morning.
top names in climate change are on Bloomberg. I want everybody committed to the kind of action that we need. We have a global emergency now. You know, we're still putting 162 million tons of man-made global warming pollution into the sky every day, using the sky as an open sewer. That's trapping as much extra heat as would be released by 600,000 Hiroshima-class atomic bombs exploding every day. That's what the scientists tell us, and it, the data shows it. That's crazy. That's why we have a third of Pakistan underwater. That's why we have the historic heat wave in China. Nothing comparable to that ever. That's why the heat records are broken every year. And we're seeing in, an increase in the flows of climate refugees crossing international borders that, that are due to vastly expand unless we take action to solve the climate crisis. Nobody covers climate change like Bloomberg, your global business authority. Bloomberg UK, your source for news and analysis covering the biggest challenges facing the UK government, economy, financial services, and markets. Tax cuts should not be the priority. It's about a credible plan for growth over the next two, three years. In this post-Brexit world, how do you see actually servicing your clients? It was disruptive, and it's going to have implications to how capital raising works. Now we're having the perfect storm in the UK. Watch Francine Lacqua Thursdays at 9.30 a.m. only on Bloomberg, your global business authority. This is Bloomberg Surveillance. We are getting some data from the Treasury Department as they announce what they plan to do with their financing for this quarter. The expectation is that they are going to borrow quite a bit more than they previously expected, which did lead to a sell-off in the 30-year. Uh, just uh, yesterday, yesterday afternoon, right now, in the 30-year Treasury, you can see it going up 4.1 percent. That is the highest level going back to November. Joining us now with the latest numbers from the Treasury Department is Michael McKee. Mike. Well, Lisa, the Treasury said they were going to borrow over a trillion dollars in this quarter, and the question is, how are they going to pay for it? Well, pretty much as the market expected, by raising auction sizes. Not so much in August, but they're going to raise throughout the quarter. Here's the first refunding numbers that come out for this month. These will be auctions held next week. $103 billion total, uh, refunding $84 billion in, in maturing securities and raising $19 billion in new cash. And as you can see, three-year note of 42 billion, 10 year at 38, and the 30 year bond comes in at 23 billion for next week. Now, the increases I talked about are going to be relatively substantial, but again, not unexpected. Uh, they're raising the uh, two year by 9 billion, the three by six, and the five by nine, and then seven, uh, 10, and 30s, as well as uh, they go through the quarter. They will uh, parcel this out month by month, but it will end up uh, with a much higher auction schedule. And they say going forward, it'll depend on the performance of the economy and, of course, what tax receipts come in. One other note of interest in this release is that the Treasury says it has made significant progress on its plans to implement a regular buyback program in 2024. Uh, they don't have that program in place yet, but it does seem to be moving forward. So that is something to look forward to, perhaps at the next refunding. We'll see you in November for that. And just real quick here, it also says the Treasury does expect auction sizes to be boosted going forward. So how much is this a sign? This is just a, a signal of what's to come. It's a signal of what's to come. Uh, but again, the mixture is what matters to the market. Uh, they do say they're going to raise uh, Treasury bill issuance some because they're still trying to rebuild the Treasury general account and get to $600 billion by the end of September. All right, Mike, stay close. Uh, we're going to follow up on this in just a bit. What you're seeing in the market is a pretty tepid reaction. The two-year yield did surge on the heels of what we saw at the ADP report that came out with the jobs number higher than expected, just a, a little bit higher than where we started the session, 4.89 percent. That's where it settled down. After this announcement, similar kind of muted action, 4.1 percent on the 30-year. So not a lot of drama. This was really baked in already yesterday afternoon when we got the news. Still, though, there is this broader backdrop today 
after Fitch downgraded the U.S.'s credit rating of what debt does to the profile of a nation that is seeing its interest expenses surge and a lot of its spending also stay fairly high. Rob Arnott joining us right now, chairman of Research Affiliates, who is an incredible theorist on all things markets and has been for years as he's managed his money as well as advises on a PIMCO fund and uh, does a host of other markets-related activities. To me, there is a key question here. At what point do you care, not about the Fitch rating, but about the debt overhang that does have a much more expensive profile? The debt overhang matters, but it matters less than the spending. If the spending was under control, the debt would be just fine. Uh, the fact that there are buyers for the debt tells you that it's okay. Now, John Malden likes to refer to the bang moment when everything's going fine and then suddenly, bang, it's not. And no one knows where the bang moment is, but it's out there. And so we have to be very, very concerned, not about the deficit spending, but about the spending itself. Every dollar that's spent by the government represents resources, human resources, financial resources, um, being pulled away from the private sector where products are created that people want to buy into government programs. Uh, how often do we go consciously seek out government to uh, help us on this or that. Not so much. Well, what we're seeing right now is a number of candidates for president who are coming out with economic plans, none of whom are going to say that they're going to cut Social Security because that's dead on arrival in terms of political candidacy. Correct. And on the flip side, you see interest expenses rising, and there is this serious consideration of at what point this matters on a fundamental level. As an investor... When do you start to say, we need to build in a higher premium, risk premium, yield premium on treasuries? Well, I think the market's telling us that that's happening. Now, it's not necessarily happening on equities just yet, but that does represent a risk. Uh, we came out with a report just two days ago taking a deep dive on, on inflation. Back in January, uh, we looked back at 2022. We found that 6.5% inflation was about 6% in the first half of the year and half a percent in the second half of the year. That's a percent a month, first half of the year. Uh, a tenth of a percent a month, second half of the year. Why does that matter? Coming into this year, we assumed, what if inflation month by month throughout 2023 exactly matches the three-year average? 46 basis points a month. Well, if you replace 1% with 46 basis points, year-over-year -year inflation will seem to be dropping half a percent a month, but it's an illusion. If you replace a tenth of a percent with 46 basis points, it'll appear to be rising a third of a percent a month, but it's an illusion. So flatline inflation during calendar year 2023 won't look like a flatline. It'll look like a V. And, that, and we showed that um, with that really simple assumption, inflation would fall to 2.9 by mid-year and rise to 5.7 by the end of the year. So just taking a step back and the overview, the lead on this is you think that there is a much greater risk that inflation resurges and, and goes uh, substantially higher and stays higher for a longer period of time than the market is currently accounting for. How are you translating that into where you're positioning, what's being mispriced in markets right now? Inflationary shocks, and it's interesting. <clears throat> it shouldn't be a shock that inflation tanked the first half of the year. It shouldn't be a shock if inflation rebounds the second half of the year because of the months we're replacing. We're replacing no inflation with some inflation. And so what shouldn't be a surprise sadly is a surprise. Most Fed watchers are thinking we'll finish the year a little higher, three and a half foot, maybe four. And uh, they haven't done their arithmetic. That would imply one to two percent annualized inflation in the second half of the year. The investment implications are straightforward. Inflation surprise is a risk off trade. Inflation surprise means risk assets don't do as well. And so I'd be cautious coming into the second half of the year because most investors will be surprised by inflation. Um, the Fed may be surprised by inflation. They have 400 PhD economists, which is four times as many as Harvard and MIT combined, 
but they seem unable to forecast GDP, unemployment, inflation. If they can't forecast it, how the heck are they going to manage it? Which has been something that's a perennial concern and one reason for uh, the credibility gap that you keep hearing people uh, yeah. talking about. You said that, that uh, things sort of chug along and then there's a bang moment. Right. And that's kind of when people come to some realization. Do you have a sense of what that catalytic moment would look like, what it is? Uh, firstly, I think it's a ways off. But it can happen in a recession where you find that you want to stimulate and <clears throat> the markets won't let you. So that happened with Greece in their debt crisis in 2011. Um, and we're not Greece of 2011. Let me get that straight. But um, we're headed that direction, which is alarming. Wait, hold on a second. So you're basically saying uh, that the U.S. will not be able to borrow in the way that they think they're going to be able to borrow at the rates at that they want to borrow stage. at some stage that and could be that moment. Whether that's three years from now or 12 years from now, I don't know. But the current trajectory has us. Uh, it's like Wile E. Coyote uh, running off a cliff and suddenly looking down and then he falls. Well, and this is what some people are <laughs> pointing to, that the idea that we have the debt profile that we do at a time when the unemployment rate is 3.5%, 3.6%, is concerning to some people because where does that leave the juice to stimulate? Bob Michael of J.P. Morgan Asset Management was just here, and he was saying, well, actually, it's a backward-looking indicator, and the economy isn't that strong. Do you push back on that? that there is this sort of loss of momentum, this loss of strength under the hood that you could see in some small corners that will come to the fore more meaningfully later on. Well, I think he's right. The economy always looks booming just before a recession. And people think, how can anything go wrong here? Uh, now, the good news is there's two job openings for every job seeker. Um, that's unusual to have that in advance of a recession. But we do have an inverted yield curve. Cam Harvey, who's been on, on the show, I believe, uh, was the one who first discovered that a, an inverted yield curve predicts a recession. I don't think it predicts a recession. I think it causes a recession. Well, here's the uh, that's actually a, a good question around the uh, opportunity to lend long versus lend short and what mm -hmm. that does to people's money. Just sort of in sum, and, and I, I think that this is the important thing, this is a high moment of uncertainty, and everyone keeps talking about that. And so uh, maybe it's a better thing to talk about the distribution of risks and understand the probability of certain risks and how they're priced. Which probability is the least priced or the most mispriced that you see right now in markets regarding the economic trajectory? The most mispriced is inflation, um, the, the break-even inflation, which is the difference between tips yields and treasury bond yields is 2.2 percent. Um, our work suggests that three to three and a half is a more likely 10-year number because it takes a while for recession to get, uh, for inflation to get reined in. And uh, we did a study looking at uh, four, all 14 of the developed economies that were already developed in 1970, uh, 50 years of data on 14 countries. When inflation crosses 6%, and especially when it crosses 8%, it's rarely transitory. It's usually a consequence of policy blunders. And the inflation doesn't really get set, settled down until the policy blunders are reversed. We're not seeing that yet. Robert not. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you. Robert Knott, uh, Chair of Research Affiliates. If you are just uh, joining the program, we are seeing S&P futures uh, substantially uh, unchanged. I mean, they're down a little bit after uh, yesterday, uh, also being somewhat range-bound, perhaps taking a breath. We're seeing a decline of six-tenths of a percent, 45.72. And Michael McKee, a Bloomberg Economics correspondent, back with us after taking a look more closely at the refinancing agreement. And I have to say, it is really quite uh, material to me that this is the discussion of how much more the U.S. Treasury Department has to borrow at a time when we're talking about the credit rating yeah. of 
the company, uh, of the company country, I should say, excuse me. I'm just wondering whether there are any details that you think people should be paying attention to in this refinancing agreement that do point to the borrowing proclivities of the United States. Well, it's almost the uh, borrowing needs uh, release that came out on Monday that gets your attention because they're going to borrow a trillion dollars this quarter and next quarter they're going to borrow a little over 800 billion. So you're talking about $2 billion uh, in the last half of the year, or trillion dollars, I'm sorry. Uh, and, and that is... It's hard uh, to lose. Yeah, it's, it's hard to, trillion hard to here, trillion track. there. Uh, and, and that's a significant amount of money. But it doesn't seem to be moving the markets at all in terms of repricing uh, risk. And you look at the term premia for the two-year, the 10-year, they're still well negative. So the market is telling you it's still going to buy this stuff. Um, it'll be interesting to see now that Japan is maybe moving forward to getting rid of yield curve control, whether that brings money back to Japan and away from buying some of these U.S. Treasuries. We'll see what the uh, uh, the, the numbers tell us when these auctions are uh, take place next week. But it does seem that um, this is something that, if projected out, can't continue. But then you uh, think about uh, <laughs> the old law about if it can't continue. It won't. Yeah. Stein's law. Um, and, you know, we'll see. Michael McKee, Bloomberg Economics Correspondent, thank you, as always, uh, for all of that. I'm looking right now at a two-year yield at session highs, 2.9 percent after a, an ADP number coming in substantially above expectations, as well as a refinancing agreement, uh, a refinancing plan by the U.S. Treasury Department that is higher than they indicated a while back. This is Bloomberg. Knife making is almost meditative for me. There's a lot of passion behind it. There's a lot of hard work behind it. And it's not just something that you kind of just brush off like, oh, this is just a knife. People hands touch this knife. People pour their passion and their soul inside of these products. The art of blacksmithing has a very long history our notion of what it means to be civilized is to have metallurgy, to have the ability to transform the natural world. When somebody used my knife, I wanted them to say, damn! <laughs> Golly, this is a, a badass knife. <laughs> Access the financial world on demand. Hear from leading economists, policymakers, and industry experts via live and on demand webinars only from Bloomberg. Start exploring to see what's moving the markets. Visit Bloomberg.com webinars. Good morning. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on TV and radio. Welcome to Bloomberg Markets, China Open. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to The Pulse. This is Bloomberg Technology. And welcome to Balance of Power. This is Bloomberg. interesting and it does cause people to stop and pause and ask these questions which they should ask and in terms of the last 20 years i would say there has been an erosion in terms of the u.s and our governance relative to other countries even though these are really vanity ratings from a practical perspective it causes you to ask the questions because over 50 years 100 years eventually you do lose flexibility but in terms of are we doing a trade on this no Vanity ratings, a fantastic description as many people shrug off the Fitch downgrade of the United States to AA plus from AAA. That was Robert Tipp, chief investment strategist at PGM Fixed Income, who was on earlier with us to talk about uh, the rating shift. And it comes at a time where we just got the Treasury Department saying they're going to borrow a trillion dollars in this quarter versus $733 billion previously expected. A big question in the market today is how much 
much the political instability, the political questions, some of the uh, overhang is really going to cause volatility in markets amid earnings that have been coming in strong. Gina Martins Adams joining us right now of Bloomberg Intelligence. Uh, Gina, how much are you seeing any sign that we could end up with uh, volatility in markets, some response, some adjustment to the political overhang? I think the equity market will take their cues on the political environment from the bond market, frankly. And so until you see some elevated vol volatility emerge in the bond market, it's unlikely the equity market will pay attention, mostly because of the point we are in the earnings stream. As you noted, earnings are coming in significantly better than anticipated. More than 80% of companies beat expectations so far this reporting season, which are statistics we haven't seen since 2021. Um, really strong earnings beats are translating into pretty consistent outlook improvements for 2024. So the equity market is going to tie to that sort of earnings environment. Recall coming into this year, we were anticipating a massive earnings recession. At least that's what our model suggested was implied in prices. So not to get that earnings recession is the, the trigger for equity market sort of strength. Uh, unless the bond market starts to capitulate or create some sort of waves for the equity market, the equity market's going to look at that or earnings data and, and certainly tied to that in my in my view. Gina, one thing that people have been talking about this morning, especially after the Fitch uh, development, has been why the equity market has not responded to higher yields that are inflecting higher yet again today. Do you think that that is an accurate assessment that equities have not responded to these higher yields? Or do you think that the earnings have been good enough for a lot of traders to just look past that? Yeah, I mean, I think it's just very short-term thinking, frankly. If you look at the longer term, equities did respond to the higher yields in the form of valuation suppression over the course of the last year. And when you look at the equal-weighted index, the equity market is still trading well below its pre-pandemic average levels. So I think a lot of that is really just short-termism. Uh, you know, the equity market doesn't necessarily plot hand-in-hand -hand with the bond market on a day-to-day, week-to-week, month-to-month basis. But over the long term, you would anticipate that higher bond yields would translate into lower valuations. And that's pretty much exactly what we've seen, with the exception of the biggest stocks in the S&P, which, of course, have re-rated to enormously high premiums relative to the rest of the market. And that's really about the earnings outlook. That segment has re-rated, sort of anticipating a much, much stronger earnings environment emerging as a result of some secular shifts, in particular with AI, but also with what's going on in the semiconductors industry and some government programs in response to the pandemic. So I do think you have to decompose the equity market into its moving parts to really get a clear analysis of what's going on. And I certainly wouldn't suggest that the bond market is the only factor that drives stocks. Meanwhile, in the bond market, we are looking at the United States saying that it is going to continue to increase its borrowing after uh, planning $103 billion in debt sales and announcing some of the refinancing plans. Joining us as well is Ira Jersey, who covers all things rates for us for Bloomberg Intelligence. Ira, can you get us a sense of how well this is being priced in in terms of the degree to which the Treasury Department is going to have to ramp up its borrowing? Yeah, so, so the, the Treasury Department just this morning, uh, about 20 minutes ago, announced that it was going to increase uh, the, the amount of uh, two-year notes, three-year notes, you know, all of the, the Treasury uh, coupon auctions are going to be increased by a little bit more than uh, what I think the market was expecting prior to Monday's announcement. So, Lisa, you mentioned that Monday the Treasury Department told us they were going to borrow a trillion dollars instead of about $750 billion. So, we, you know, once we saw that, we, you know, everyone took a step back and said, hey, maybe there's going to be a little bit more issuance. I think that's one of the reasons you saw some weakness in the market yesterday, where uh, you had 10-year yields uh, go above 4% once again. Um, th that's in anticipation of this additional supply. So supply is going to have an effect on the pricing of, uh, of Treasury securities. Meanwhile, we are hearing pretty much a collective shrug about the downgrade that Fitch made to the U.S. credit rating. And Ira, I'd love your, I'd love your uh, take on this. We heard from Peter Shear over at Academy of Securities. He said, basically, nobody buys a treasury for its credit rating. Do you think there are longer term implications just in general with interest rates rising and just the idea that we are going to have higher interest payments and possibly a more discerning buyer? 
So I think there's, there's th kind of three components to what you just said. I think number one is there is no structural forced selling that's going to happen because of the ratings downgrade. So I think that there's this misconception that people can only buy AAA securities. That's not true. Treasuries are their own asset class. So so that's that's one thing that you have to get out of your kind of vernacular and, and your thinking when you think about the downgrade. Um, the second thing is is that yes, you're right. There will definitely be um, you know additional potential risk of of future downgrades. You you know, Moody still hasn't downgraded the U.S. yet. That could easily be coming in the next couple of weeks or months. Um, and, and primarily because of that higher interest cost that you're mentioning, larger deficits plus higher yields mean that you have higher interest costs for the government, which really reduces fl fiscal flexibility. So what happens when we do get an eventual downturn in the economy that requires some kind of fiscal response in order to deal with the, uh, with a weak economy? It, it, you don't have as much fiscal flexibility now with the interest payments being such a large part of discretionary spending. So, um, to, so the government does need to, and, I, and maybe this will be a little bit of a wake-up call to Congress to say, hey, you have to deal with some of the fiscal imbalances that we have right now and get them on a more sustainable path. Gina, from your vantage point, how much uh, do Treasury yields matter at a certain level? You said that right now yields do matter. They are being priced in. At what point do yields become the dominant story for stocks? You know, they could become the dominant story if earnings growth deteriorates materially or the economic environment deteriorates materially, resulting in another downdraft in earnings trends. If you think about the two primary drivers of stocks and the valuation side, certainly rates are a very, very strong driver of valuations. But then you've got earnings growth, which honestly rates have a very small impact on overall earnings growth in the S&P 500. So in an environment where earnings are actually X energy, you've got the earnings side of the equation really powering some great degree of optimism in the EV market. Gina, That's where the vulnerability would lie. You're, you're freezing up. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Gina Martin-Adams. Ira, just final word here in terms of what you would look for, especially after some of what we've heard. You, we've heard from Brian Weinstein of Morgan Stanley saying that he sees the floor for 10-year yields at 4%. And then we've heard from Bob Michael saying, no, what we are seeing is inflation coming down rapidly. Do you have a view on where the market is pricing it and what's the likely outcome? Well, when it comes to inflation and, and where we're probably headed, you know, the what, one of the things that we the, we note is that you know the the size of the government debt market matters insofar as you know where how low you can get versus say Fed funds and and the pricing of other instruments. Um, I do think that ten year yields will probably uh, rally into year end if uh, if Anna Wong and the Bloomberg Economics team uh, forecasts are right and we're going to see a weaker economy later this year. I would still suspect that we'll see a three handle on. On, uh, on 10 year yields uh, by the end of the year, maybe around three and a half percent, maybe even a little bit lower, um, depending on how weak the economy ultimately gets. And of course, that comes even with Fitch downgrading the U.S. credit rating. Ira Jersey, thank you so much for joining us on a day when very much the U.S. debt profile is in focus. Coming up on Bloomberg Television at 1 p.m., Richard Francis, co head of the America's Sovereigns at Fitch Ratings, the person who everyone wants to speak to in terms of why this decision was made and why now, given the fact that we have seen the uh, debt to GDP ratio really kind of fluctuate and adjust even lower slightly as the U.S. economy has increased right now in markets, you're not seeing a major reaction to the uh, Fitch ratings downgrade, although you did uh, see yesterday a reaction to the refunding announcement that we got today from the Federal Reserve. The Nasdaq lower by about eight tenths of a percent, the S&P lower by about six tenths of a percent. You could see a little bit of dollar strength. The euro, uh, 109.64, yield slightly higher. That 10-year yield, 4.06%. And crude, we didn't talk about this today, but really a question, how high could it go? $81.95, up 7 tenths of a percent, traded on the NYMEX. This Friday, Wall Street Week comes to you from Colorado. Join David Weston for the 2023 Aspen Economic Strategy Group meeting. Special guests Cecilia Rouse, Rafael Bostic, Brian Moynihan, David Cody, Austin Goolsby, and Larry Summers join David Weston for exclusive conversations on persistent inflation, rising debt, and demographic challenges in the U.S. and around the world. It's a Wall Street Week you won't want to miss. This Friday at 6 p.m. Eastern, only on Bloomberg Television and Radio. From the world of politics. We're not going to be relying 
upon countries whose values we don't share. To the world of business. It's all about corporate power of the end. Balance of Power, live from Bloomberg's Washington headquarters. We're going to be more excited at what's in store for you. How long will it take? How many years? Why don't we take this one day at a time? Good luck. Everybody has a perspective. Every weekday at 5 p.m. Eastern time, join hosts Anne-Marie Hordern. It's the one area, really, of bipartisanship. Well, I think we're getting more of it. That's an optimistic. And Joe Matthew. The debt ceiling is looming. How close are we going to get to the line before you start to worry? Alongside Kaylee Lyons. The door was open for regulators to do more. And that puts the Fed between a rock and a hard place. As they deliver news. This is such an important economic issue. He's Plus. no longer trying to run away from that. It. Really a blue some mind. Insight. We can both invest in law enforcement and also make sure that communities feel safe in their own skin. And analysis. I think your audience would get this more than most. It's not the Republican Party that you know. It allows him to do what he did so successfully in 2020 which is run against crazy. From and about politics' biggest power players. This was the zombie case, and it's now more than well alive. That's for sure, uh, with two more potentially to come. I'm willing to have this battle. It is vitally important. This is the intersection of Washington and Wall Street. Bringing people directly to the decision makers right. that impact your investments and your life. Balance of Power, every weekday at 5 p.m. Eastern, only on Bloomberg, your global business authority. we're working on at the moment is how do we charge back into Ukraine as soon as uh, the European authorities say it's safe to fly in Ukraine again. Now, nobody knows when that is going to be. But we were Ukraine's second largest airline when the Russians invaded on the 24th of February last year. We would be Ukraine's biggest airline the week after they tell us it's safe to go back in there because we're going to charge back in there. Initially, we have a plan to open up about 30 routes from four Ukrainian airports back into the European Union. And then we want to, I think, in the first within six to 12 months, open up three or four large bases in Ukraine. And we're talking to the Ukrainian authorities about creating an environment cost agreement on which we could lead the charge of air travel uh, into a post-war Ukrainian recovery. Downgrade, what downgrade? Live from New York City this morning. Good morning, good morning. Your equity market just a little bit lower, negative by 0.6%. The countdown to the open starts right now. Everything you need to get set for the start of U.S. trading. This is Bloomberg, the open with Jonathan Farrow. for New York coming up, the U.S. stripped of its AAA rating by Fitch, the White House scrambling to stem the political fallout as market participants line up to criticize the move. We begin with the big issue. Here we go again. More than a decade after S&P Global Rating stripped the U.S. of its highest credit rating, Fitch making a move of its own. The rating downgrade of the United States reflects the expected fiscal deterioration, a high and growing general government debt burden, and the erosion of governance. Secretary Yellen pushing back, calling the move arbitrary, outdated, adding, quote, Fitch's decision does not change what Americans, investors, and people all around the world already know. The Treasury securities remain the world's preeminent safe and liquid assets. Prominent economists elsewhere piling on the criticism. Mohammed al Erin labelling the downgrade a strange move. Larry Summers said he can't imagine any serious analyst giving the decision any weight at all. And on Wall Street, a whole host of guests echoing that sentiment. The Fitch rating downgrade came as a surprise. A little bit surprising. A bit of a head scratcher. Clearly it's not good news. It's never good when a rating agency says, OK, we, we don't like your debt as much as we used to. I questioned uh, Fitch across the board and particularly the timing. This comes at an economically sensitive time. Politically, I think it is bad news for Biden. The last thing that Yellen really needs. From a market's perspective. The market took it on quite well. The initial market reaction uh, pretty moderate. The whole response has been fairly muted. The main question is, does this compromise the reserve currency status yes. of the U.S. dollar? There really is no viable alternative. One never wants to forecast the demise of, of the dollar. This probably doesn't really move the needle. It doesn't seem to kind of create any market disruption. In the long run, very, very little impact. 
Your team coverage starts right now with Bloomberg's Amory in Washington, D.C., Mike McKee here in New York. AMH, walk us through the political fallout in the last 24 hours. Well, we heard from the Treasury Secretary, and she's saying this is arbitrary. What we've seen from the Biden administration is they think this is baseless, and they really took issue, and they are criticizing Fitch for this. But they are pointing the finger to Trump. And they're saying this is MAGA Republicans who have done this. And this is also the likes of what we heard from uh, Senator Chuck Schumer. He was saying it's the fact the Republicans flirted with the debt ceiling. And that is a fact that why Fitch had this downgrade. Now, on the other side of the aisle, Jonathan, you have the Republicans. The head of the House GOP campaign said that this has to do everything with Bidenomics. So obviously, this is going to be the latest political punching bag in Washington, D.C. It is Fitch. And the, the fact of the matter is Democrats and Republicans are both going to point the finger that it was their party that is the, the fact that we have this downgrade. And Fitch is pointing to the deterioration in U.S. government standards in its announcement. So this is only going to get worse as we go towards the November 2024 election. The issue that Biden, of course, faces is that he is the sitting president during this downgrade. My McKee, that's the political fallout, the market fallout, I have to say, pretty limited this morning. Yeah, uh, I think this uh, deserves a quote from that famous economist William Shakespeare. Sound and fury signifying nothing. <laughs> you take a look at the 2011 S&P downgrade and what happened after that? Well, there was a sharp move down the day they announced it and uh, the Monday after, and then <laughs> look what happened. The dollar went up, stocks went up, and bond yields went down. Everybody forgot about it, and it wasn't a big deal. Even though the deficit was a major political issue that year, it wasn't an issue for the markets. Now, the reason people are criticizing Fitch is that a year ago, Fitch upgraded the United States credit rating to stable and said there were three criteria under which they would downgrade the U.S. A significant or sustained rise in the debt-to-GDP ratio? That didn't happen. Deterioration in governance quality? Well, it's not particularly great, but they did get through the debt ceiling without a major fight. And then macro policy performance and prospects, well, those are much improved. The economy is growing strongly, inflation's coming down, and unemployment remains low. So why did they do this? Well, tune in later. We'll ask Fitch. But here's the biggest bottom line of it all, John, is you take a look at the term premium for the U.S. two-year and 10-year notes, and it's still well below zero, still very negative. That tells you people are going to keep buying Treasury paper, even with the big issuance upgrade that we got this week. Uh, there seem to be a lot of people who want to own Treasuries, and as your uh, guest Bob Michael said a little while ago, nobody buys Treasuries because of a ratings agency. Very, very true. But my McKee, when the Treasury Secretary says arbitrary and outdated, it does come on the same day that the Treasury Secretary and the Treasury has to announce a much, much bigger refunding announcement than we had otherwise anticipated just several months ago. Down the road, this could be a problem, but that is down the road, and Washington likes to kick the can. The issue is, when do you get to a point where the interest rates rise on the debt because people don't want to buy it? And it doesn't seem to be any signal that that's coming anytime soon. And they've got time to work on this, uh, if they so choose. Mike McKee, thank you, sir. Alongside AMH, Anne-Marie will touch base with you in about 30 minutes' time on the latest drama elsewhere in Washington, D.C. Let's get to the panel. Invest goes Mo Hagbin, Chris Mamani of Lafayette College. Chris, now we have to start with two questions. One, is it justified? And two, does it matter? Well, so whether it is justified or not, I, I, I think on that front, uh, the, the, the problem uh, Fitch has is that they laid out the criteria so clearly and everyone is going to pile on them uh, for uh, kind of not sticking to the criteria that they laid out. But if you kind of take a step back, uh, if, if it was AAA before, and given what has happened over the last, let's say, three, four, five years, and given where uh, things are going, is it totally unjustified? Probably not. Having said that, the likelihood that it has any impact on trading levels or, uh, or the market I think if, even in the sh short run, uh, away from today or maybe tomorrow, I think the, the likelihood of any impact is pretty, pretty small at this moment. Well, Hagbin, does it make a difference? 
Hey, John. I, I mean, I agree with Krishna, absolutely. Uh, you know, I think the bigger impact here is going to be politics and reputation. But from a markets perspective, we've already seen it. There hasn't been much of a reaction. You could argue a little bit in the equity market, but nothing in the bond market. You know, we kind of saw this happen in 2011 as well. And, you know, there was an, an, a short-term impact, but really it was kind of shrugged off by the market. So, you know, there's no change in my uh, view in terms of the, you know, the the relative attractiveness of yields and the the, the kind of stable collateral uh, that treasuries provide globally. You know, it is kind of the basis of the financial system, and I don't I don't see that changing anytime soon. It's almost 12 years to the day, August 5th, 2011. Since then, the dollar's up by something like 40 percent on the dollar index, and U.S. assets have outperformed much of the world. The backdrop, Krishna, back in 2011 is so, so different to what we're experiencing now. Krishna, could you speak to that, the difference between what we were talking about with the general economy in 2011 and the kind of conversations we're having now? I, absolutely. I think, uh, and uh, to, uh, to some extent, that is why, having laid out the criteria, the timing is so galling in some people's mind. And you know, the 2011, the outlook was extraordinarily bad. At that time, we were we were thinking that we will be in sub 1% growth environment forever. And for a while, that's where we ended up being. I, I think the economic outlook after the, uh, the policy decisions, especially fiscal policy decisions coming out of uh, COVID have been extraordinarily good and extraordinarily effective. Uh, and the challenges that we are dealing with today is how to control inflation rather than uh, uh, dealing with a situation where growth outlook was going to be uh, subpar for a very long period of time. And this is more of a solvable problem. So I think uh, we are in a much better position today. There are some numbers we need to talk about, though. The Treasury, 38 minutes ago, it's boosted the size of its quarterly sales and longer-term debt for the first time in two and a half years. We learned yesterday, on the same day of this downgrade, that the Treasury Department needs to increase net borrowing estimates for the July through September quarter, so the one we're in right now, from $733 billion to $1 trillion. It was only back in May they were looking for $733. That's a big amount of money, Mohag bin. That additional supply, never mind the downgrade, let's take that additional supply, the fiscal deficit, what it's going to look like through the rest of this year, what does that mean for Treasuries? Yeah, so John, I mean, I think there's, to, to Krishna's earlier point, some justification. I mean, debt to GDP levels are elevated relative to other triple A uh, countries, and I don't think there's any ignoring of that fact, right? So there is a problem in terms of debt. You know, I think what's really going to be the bigger driver, in my opinion, is relative yields and demand. And I don't see the demand for treasuries changing, at least in the short term. So from a market perspective, I stick to kind of what I said earlier. I don't see this being a huge kind of volatility event or any type of, um, you know, risk uh, to the treasury market. Uh, but longer term, you know, it's, 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 it's something that we need to address, I think, as a nation. I mean, the debt levels are elevated and relative to peers. Uh, it's something that we need to take note of. Krishna, looking at yields right now, the 10-year up by six basis points. On the session, the curve steeper. The 30-year up by 7.4.16%. Spoke to a guest earlier this morning, Krishna. I wonder if this resonates with you. He said yields feel so high now because they've been so low over the last 10 years. But Krishna, if you could just erase the last 10 years, you looked at the fundamentals of the U.S. economy, where the Fed is, where inflation is, where the labor market is, where growth is, where should the 10-year yield be? So I, I, I think uh, we have talked about this before. I think the direction of uh, travel for yields, in my judgment, is higher rather than lower. I, I think expecting us to revisit uh, the last 15 years from yield terms, I think will basically require a, big, a total change in direction with respect to fiscal policy, which given the success of it, probably does not happen. So I think yields are probably going to be higher for, uh, for an extended period of time than they have been over the last 15 years. Whether 4% is good enough, I don't think so. I think given the potential for reacceleration in the short run, I think the direction of travel is higher, closer to 4.5% before we go down lower because things will slow down. Mo Hagman, do you agree? I do agree. From a positioning standpoint, we're also neutral duration. So we've added risk to the portfolio over the last month, but that's that's more on the equity and, and riskier credit side. Um, you know, the the 
the, the amount of kind of premium that investors expect, I think, is going to change, right? To, to, to Krishna's point, uh, economic growth is coming in stronger than expected. The macro backdrop is much more favorable. Uh, and the demand for, for yield from clients is going to go up. So I think, you know, you know four, four and a half percent is probably not the right number. We probably are going to be uh, with a five handle. Uh, and and that, that could be in the near term. Uh, it could also be something where uh, the yield of the share, the yield of the, the, the shape of the yield curve uh, starts to renormalize, right? So we're we're kind of seeing uh, the probability of rate cuts uh, sometime in the in the second half of next year. Um, but you could kind of see some renormalization of that yield curve. Mo Krishna, stick with us. Your bond market today, Treasuries are softer, yields are higher. Yields are higher not because of the downgrade that we got yesterday. Yields are higher because the data this morning was better than expected, and that additional supply coming out of the Treasury, which we'll discuss throughout this morning. Let's get you some movers going into the opening bell. Here's Abby. Hey, John. Well, right now we're looking at U.S. futures heading to their worst day in almost a month. So big, some of the big draggers, not surprisingly, some of the heavyweight tech names, including Amazon, they report, of course, tomorrow. Nerves coming out ahead of that report. And actually, this is a little bit of a different board, so you can see that advanced micro devices uh, up 2.3%, decent quarter. CVS, uh, down 2.2%. The quarter was okay, but perhaps some folks are a little bit nervous about uh, the job cuts that they're making. And then you can see uh, there's Amazon down nine tenths of 1%. And they are, of course, reporting tomorrow. And 8.6% uh, revenue growth, John, on a 57% year to date rally. Investors nervous. That happened to Microsoft last week, where they uh, basically met estimates, but uh, single digit revenue growth not doing it. And then Starbucks off the lows, down seven tenths of 1%. Third quarter sales miss. And of course, there's a China concern there, John. Abby, thank you. There's been a China concern through much of this year. Coming up, pushing out the recession calls or just ditching them altogether? I'm more on the optimistic side. I think a, a softish landing is, is what's going to happen. doesn't mean we won't have potentially negative GDP growth for a couple quarters, but kind of like early 2022, small negative, but with a resilient labor market, it won't feel like a recession. Bank of America and Mike Gapen, the latest to make a move. That conversation up next. They've always gone together. But never before have sports been so massively influential and as lucrative as they are today. NFL, NBA, none of them were what they are today when they were born. There's leagues that are being thought of and built every day. New teams, new leagues, new business models, even entirely new sports. I never in a million years would have thought this is what my life would be like. We set out to find what's happening and what's about to happen at the nexus of business, sports, and culture. Getting involved from a business perspective was something that was very natural and an easy transition for me. From the pickleball courts of Arizona. To the Kabaddi tournaments in India. To the cornhole boards at your local tailgate. Oh! This is what's next in sports. on TV and radio. Welcome to Bloomberg Markets, China Open. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to The Pulse. This is Bloomberg Technology. And welcome to Balance of Power. This is Bloomberg. In terms of the last 20 years, I would say there has been an erosion in terms of the U.S. and our governance relative to other countries. It does cause people to stop and pause and ask these questions, which they should ask. There is an acknowledgement that debt matters, that you want to be sustainable. And the United States has had a soaring debt. 
P. James Roberts here weighing in on Fitch's downgrade as the ratings agency doubts U.S. fiscal strength. Bank of America is upgrading its view on the economy and dropping its recession call. A team of economists led by Michael Gapen saying this, recent incoming data has made us reassess our prior view that a mild recession in 2024 is the most likely outcome. Growth in economic activity over the past three quarters has averaged 2.3 percent. The unemployment rate has remained near all-time lows and wage and price pressures are moving in the right direction. Mo Hagbin, Chris Mamani, back with us. Mo Hagbin, there's another one. Dropping the recession call or pushing it out. I've seen this time and time again over the last several weeks. I'm sure you have over the last several months. Mo, you are constructive on risk assets. How much of it is about this elusive nirvana that people think maybe can materialize, a soft landing? Yeah, unfortunately, I'm not going to be a, a contrarian on this, on this point. So we tend to be in the same camp. We're a bit more on the optimistic side. And we see, you know, leading economic indicators and sentiment suggesting that, you know, it, we will continue to see some strength in the, the global economy. Now, we don't know if there's going to be a little bit of a soft patch. I think we are kind of in that soft landing uh, camp. That doesn't mean this is the beginning of a new cycle. But in the short term, from a tactical perspective, we are adding risk to the, to the portfolio because we do see uh, growth expectations being repriced by the market. And we do see riskier parts of the market outperforming more defensive and safer parts of the market. So in the near term, we like risk assets. We like equities and riskier credit over bonds. Can you be bullish disinflation, Krishna, and constructive on earnings? Well, so I, I think that's an interesting question. Uh, so uh, to kind of reposition slightly from what Mo was saying, I think at the moment, the likelihood of a recession is pretty small. And, and I think that is getting uh, pushed out. The real question is, are we going to get into a reacceleration? And reacceleration, as you say, is going to be very good for earnings, but it is going to be very bad for uh, the mood that the Federal Reserve gets into. And uh, if we do have a reacceleration, they, then they will come back at the, at the economy much harder than they have done so far. And I think that gets us a recession rather than just the status quo and how things are moving right now. So, Mo, have we got to stay in this sweet spot of OK growth and further signs of disinflation? Any sign of a pickup? Would that make you nervous? Uh, I don't think a little bit of a pickup is going to make me nervous. I actually kind of expect it. You know, I do think even if we have uh, a little bit of more tightening in the system, it's really just we're talking about 25 basis points, right? So uh, just given the magnitude of tightening, you know, we're at kind of five and a half percent at a very short period of time, uh, you know, at 20 plus year highs. I don't see that really being meaningfully, uh, you know, uh, it's not going to have a major impact on risk assets, in my opinion. We've we've kind of looked at uh, the end, or we're looking at the end of a tightening cycle. Now, if it's a meaningful reacceleration, to Krishna's point, uh, then you could see, you know, a little bit of a, uh, you know, hawkish stance that could also be very negative for risk assets. I don't expect that, though. I expect things to be kind of in that Goldilocks uh, environment, at least for the next couple of quarters. Well, let's go through it piece by piece. Stocks are up, credit spreads are tighter, the dollar's weakened since the end of last September. The current tightness of the labor market, most people agree, Mo, you'd agree, I'm sure, is inconsistent with inflation returning back to 2% anytime soon. Bill Dudley, the former New York Fed president, made all of these points in an opinion column yesterday. And if you haven't read it, I suggest you do, because even if you disagree with it, it's thought-provoking. This quote, Krishna, from him, there's considerable evidence that the lags have shortened, shortened, he said, meaning that the economy has already felt nearly all of the impact of the Fed's actions. Krista, this is where we're at right now. You can make the argument that the lags are super long and they haven't hit yet, or you can make the argument they're super short and we've already seen them, Krishna. Which one is it? Well, so I think the issue is the lags are dependent on the structure of the economy. And what we are finding out is the, the structure of the economy, because of all the low level of rates that we had experienced over a, an extended period of time, is, has become far less income uh, uh, Fed funds rate sensitive. And that's a challenge for the Fed. And, and I, I don't think the Fed has been able to slow down the, uh, the cyclical part of the economy. And that is something that they will have to deal with if, it, if that part of the economy reaccelerates. Uh, and housing is probably the best example of that. So I, I think it's, instead of talking in terms of lags, we should be talking in terms of interest rate sensitivity of the economy and what impact policy decisions are having on, on the cyclical part of the economy. 
ADP this morning, 324. Payrolls on Friday, 200K. How many more months of that mode would we need for this Fed to sit here and say, maybe we need to go and do some more? Yeah, look, so I think we're very data dependent. We have, uh, what, two, two unemployment numbers or jobs reports, and we have two kind of inflation prints that are kind of in between the next uh, meeting. You know, I, I think, you know, we're probably going to surprise the upside, but not enough for there to be like a meaningful change in some of the rhetoric that we've heard already. We're towards the end of the tightening cycle, right? And whether it's another 25 basis points or not, I don't really see a material change in stance. Uh, I do think, and to Krishna's point, um, you know, we haven't seen necessarily all of the lagged effects, right? So we have to we have to give it a little bit more time. We haven't been in this period of tightening for very long. Um, you know, you kind of think about this last two years. It's a very, very tight uh, policy stance in a very short period of time. I am not in the camp that all of that has trickled its way into the real economy. Mo, the world's coming in your direction, constructive, increasingly so, since the last time we spoke. Mo Hagbin is going to catch up alongside Krishna Mamani. The broader market at the moment, equities negative on both the S&P and the Nasdaq going into the opening bell about seven or eight minutes away. In the Treasury market, soft, the yields up at the longer end on a 10-year up by five basis points, on a 30-year up by six basis points. This move, though, nothing really to do with the downgrade from Fitch and everything to do with two things. The data, better than expected from ADP that everyone says they don't care about until, of course, they do, and it comes out with a big upside surprise like it did this morning. And on top of that, the Treasury refunding announcement, got a teaser of that just yesterday, pushing yields higher higher, the curve's steeper. So that's the bond market. In foreign exchange at a moment, the euro negative by about 0.2%. The dollar stronger there at 109.67. Up next, the morning calls and later, Laurie Calvacina of RBC joins us around the opening bell to weigh in on the market impact of Fitch's US downgrade and look ahead to big tech earnings later this week. one of the largest and wealthiest consumer markets in the world. And there are very few global companies that can afford not to trade in the EU. So as the price for accessing the European market, these companies need to obey European regulations. That's not surprising. But often these companies choose that they will extend the European standards across their global conduct and their global production because they want to avoid the cost of complying with multiple different regulatory regimes. So there are benefits to standardization, benefits to uniform production. So all the EU needs to do is to regulate the single market. And it's then the market forces and the business incentives of global companies that transform that EU rule. Four minutes away from the opening bow, just a touch of risk aversion here. We're negative by 0.7% on the S&P on the Nasdaq lower by almost one full percentage point. That's the price action. Here's some morning calls. First up, Susquehanna downgrading Norwegian cruise line to neutral, saying the liner is still in the early to middle innings and its turnaround. We're down there by 3.4%. Wolf Research upgrading charter to outperform. The analysts seeing fiber pressure peaking and positive free cash flow. And finally, Deutsche Bank. Upgrading Sirius XM to hold, predicting that the second half of the year will be better than the first following the company's Q2 earnings report. That stock is positive by 1.2%. Up next, RBC's Laurie Calvacina on the potential market fallout from the Fitch downgrade with results from Apple and Amazon just around a corner. Live from New York, you're opening bell. Up next.
I've always been a person who's just been attracted to hair. I like to sit and think and theorize how I can manifest these uh, visions that I have for braiding and how I can take something that may seem like it's a line drawing in my mind and apply that to someone's scalp. We are the only culture that has hair that grows out of our head the way that it does. Anyone from the African diaspora is born with this amazingly curly hair that can be shaped into a variety of different ways of expression. I want Black people to love themselves for how they naturally appear and also to appreciate the cultural practices such as braiding that our ancestors have practiced for centuries. season is here. A decent start to earnings season. We are heading into the meat of earnings season. Bloomberg breaks the numbers first. We have Bank America, we have Charles Schwab. Tesla, Netflix, you name it. They're heading in the right direction. A record quarter of revenue. With exclusive expert analysis. What do they have to deliver to justify the rally we have seen? Earnings are still going to be under pressure. Is there a divergence that's really important to draw here? The massive divide between Diamond and Fraser. Bloomberg Television and Radio. The fastest numbers and analysis you trust. Forget the noise, ignore the noise. Is this just going to be noise? It's noise. It's noise versus signal. Now more to the point. What is the lesson for the observation? we go about 20 seconds away from the opening bow the session just around the corner equity futures down by three quarters of one percent on the s p on the nasdaq 100 down about one full percentage point a bit of risk aversion at the moment in the equity market disconnected to some extent from that downgrade from fish just yesterday there is a move in the bond market but the move in the bond market is about something else that's your opening bow switch to the board and get to the bond market treasury yields this morning higher by six basis points the economic data better than expected another upside surprise from the adp report going into payrolls on friday and then some Treasury issuance. You're going to get a ton more supply than we thought we'd get from the Treasury this quarter. We'll touch on that a little bit more throughout the day on Bloomberg TV and radio. Yields up, dollar stronger, euro down, negative by 0.2%, 109.65 on that currency pair. And crude just edging just a little bit lower, down negative by a quarter of 1% at $81 and about 20 cents. 25 seconds into the session, call it 30. We're negative by 0.7% on the S&P. The Nasdaq lighter, negative by about 1% at the moment. The Treasury is boosting the size of its quarterly debt sale for the first time in over two years. That bump in issuance showcasing the rising borrowing needs that prompted Fitch to lower its U.S. credit rating. Shani has more on the fallout from that. Hey, Shanali. John, I don't think you could do this without first talking about what's happening along the curve when you look at the Treasuries right now that are trading. If you take a look at the two-year, you are watching it fluctuate all morning on the back of that downgrade yesterday. Not a real impact over there on the short term. But when you look at the long term here, on the back of the funding announcements as well, remember these are three, 10, and 30-year Treasuries that are being sold. These, uh, these sizes of sales are the first we've seen in years. 
years, and you are seeing more movement at the 30 year, which I think is more interesting. It's hovering at about 416, 417. So I think the longer term ramifications of both this downgrade, as well as what you're seeing in the, the, the deluge of issuance that we're gonna see in the coming weeks are interesting. Now let's talk about the downgrade itself, because even though the market is shunning it completely, <laughs> or shunning it to a large degree, saying it doesn't really matter for the long term, America is the best game in town, you do have to think about the ramifications for the market in the short term and the long term as well. Uh, money market funds now are holding things that they have uh, told investors are worth something else <laughs> in terms of the rating. You also have to think about the credibility issue here. When you think about what it means for investors to be saying, well, what Fitch doesn't, uh, says here doesn't really matter. Does that change the appetite around risk moving forward? Then there is the pressure on treasuries overall. And uh, in a higher interest rate environment where liquidity is harder to come by, are there going to be more funding issues moving forward? We have seen the debt capital markets open back up for companies. Does a move like this start to put a wrench in that? And do the repo markets start to face some hiccups moving forward? That's what we'll be watching out for. Some crowding out potentially. Shanali, thank you for that. Just breaking down some of the issues at play here. Into the open and bound and out the other side. We're negative by about 0.8% on the S&P. Want to get into some single names for you just briefly. CVS, the drugstore chain, beating estimates for quarterly profit and sales. Its CEO saying this, we continue to execute on our strategy to expand access to health services across our care delivery channels and strengthen our consumer engagement to improve their health and well-being. Abby has more. Hey, Abby. Hey, John, and that is all true, and yet the stock is down, down more than 1%. All over the map, though, this morning, earlier in the pre-market on these results, it had been up 2%, down as much as 2%. So first, for the good news, what you were just talking about, they beat on the surface level. Uh, prescriptions filled uh, was a positive. The revenue grew 7.6% to nearly $29 billion. The insurance medical benefit ratio grew to 86.2%. The bad news, though, John, next year and the year after, for 2024, they're saying they can no longer meet their guidance of $9 per uh, share, earnings per share. And for 2025, they can no longer meet $10 of earnings per share. So that is weighing on the stock. And of course, yesterday they announced that they are doing this restructuring, cutting 5,000 jobs, more so at the corporate level. They're trying to transform into more of a healthcare company from the retail. On the year, John, CVS down more than 20% underperforming the S&P 500 essentially by 40%. This company really has their work cut out for them. Brutal. Down again this morning by, let's call it 0.8%. Abby, thank you. Different outcome for Starbucks. The coffee chain's third quarter comparable sales missing estimates. The CEO saying this, while we continue to navigate an environment with a heightened level of macro uncertainty around the world, we will execute with discipline and rigor on our priorities. Katie has more. Hey, Katie. Hey, John. Yeah, record revenue for Starbucks, but falling sales. As you mentioned, comp sales rose about 10% in the quarter. That was below analyst estimates of just about 11%. Meanwhile, adjusted EPS it did come in at a dollar. That is better than the average estimate of 95 cents and record and revenue rather. It came in at $9.2 billion. That's just short of estimates, but it's a record nonetheless. And that's thanks to higher prices and beverage add-ons over at Starbucks. So there's some good news in these numbers, but overshadowed by that disappointing comp sales print. And you look at the Wall Street reaction so far, the sell side unimpressed by the report. Jeffrey's writing that the quarter was, quote, slightly underwhelming. And you can see that in the shares as well. Starbucks currently down about half a percent or so. Kelly, thanks for that. Appreciate it. Let's turn to AMD just briefly, topping second quarter estimates and promoting advancements in AI. The CEO saying this, while we are still in the very early days of the new era of AI, it is clear that it represents a multi-billion dollar growth opportunity for the company. It has more. Morning, Ed. Yeah, good morning, Jonathan. That opportunity, $150 billion by 2027 for the market for AI accelerators. The gain in AMD short-lived, now down 8 tenths of 1%. We had opened higher, and as you saw in aftermarket trading last night, we're up by almost 4%. The market's changed its mind on something. Customer engagements increased 7x on AMD's AI products in the quarter, but that is not akin to tangible sales. Those will come later in the year in next generation AI accelerator products coming in the final three months of this year. A slight beat on the top and bottom line in the quarter just gone, but year on year negative growth on the top line, which is important. You then go to the forecast for the current period. Interesting, because at the midpoint of that forecast, it would represent top line growth of 2.5% if they hit it meaning that they would end two sequential quarters of top-line decline. 
The story really similar with AMD to what we saw with Intel. PC market seems to be recovering, but the data center business slower to recover, though Lisa Su, AMD CEO, said we would see that recovery start in the second half of this year. How often have we heard that? The stock is negative by 0.7%. Ed, thanks for that. Big day for Bloomberg Technology tomorrow, of course. Ed Ludlow, Caroline Hyde. After the close tomorrow, we're going to hear from Apple and Amazon. Those two names, the Nasdaq 100, they make up about 17% of it. So a big chunk, big slice, big weighting of that particular index. For the broader market at the moment, we're down by 0.9% on the S&P. On the Nasdaq, we're negative by 1.3%. In the Treasury market, we're down there too. Yields are higher, particularly at the long end, on a 10-year by five basis points, on a 30-year by seven. So much feedback this morning, and honestly, keep it coming, on the debt downgrade. This came from Pendle Group over in Sydney. What would replace Treasuries? And they go through things piece by piece. Euro govies, here's the quote. That's still a currency breakup accident waiting to happen because of the lack of fiscal unity. China, nobody wants that sovereign risk. Japan, the BOJ still owns half the market. That's the privileged position this Treasury market still is in the minds of so many people out there responding to that downgrade yesterday that there's nothing out there right now to replace it. Laurie Cavasina of RBC Capital Markets weighing in with her own view and saying this, and probably not too different from everyone else who was surprised to see this, especially given that markets were relatively well behaved during the debt ceiling drama. This is coming at a time when the stock market has been successfully climbing a wall of worry, but sentiment is starting to approach concerning territory. Laurie, I'm pleased to say, joins us now for more. Laurie, I've asked everyone this question. You get the chance now. How did you respond to that yesterday? <laughs> I think like everyone else, I scratched my head a bit and said, really, now? And oh, by the way, we've got 150 companies in the S&P 500 reporting earnings this week. Um, so I, I find you know, all the reactions that are coming through, John, really, really interesting. People seem both puzzled and annoyed. Um, you know, at the timing of this. And I think, you know, I certainly am scratching my head like everyone else, but we, we've got a lot of other stuff to get through this week. So I think people are going to take a beat, try to give this some thought and not overreact in the short term. Let's touch on the other stuff. I'm confused by the earnings, and it's always my issue with earnings season, Laurie, that you can pick a single name and tell whatever story you want to tell. JetBlue yeah. is saying that the domestic story is not as good as you think it is, and Caterpillar is telling me the international story is not as bad as I think it is. Which one is it? So, you know, John, we on my team, we divide up the sectors and we try to read through as much of this stuff as we can. And I will give you the caveat, I have not read anything that's come out this week. We do lag a little bit. There are three of us. Um, but the reality is that I do think the international commentary that I have seen, whether it's been about Europe or China, does feel like it's tilting negative. And that's something, you know, very different, I would say, from past reporting seasons when it felt, you know, a little more positive and then a little more mixed. And now I feel like everything I'm reading is more on the negative side. So we know obviously not every company is saying that, but it, that's really where I see the bias right now. Um, I, I do think the consumer conversation, you know, is is still pretty similar to what we've seen in the past. I have noticed some mixed, you know, sort of commentary from some of the airlines. Um, you know, I'm not going to deny that, but I do think in general the consumer is still described as very healthy, very resilient. Um, I, you know, I think that story hasn't changed. Outlooks though. Very mixed. I, I was complaining to my team the other day. I just feel like I'm not getting a whole lot of meat on the outlooks. There's just not a lot of discussion. And that's leaving me feeling pretty annoyed, frankly. You're not the only one. I'm not sure what they can offer us because everyone's been so confused by the year so far, Laurie. When you listen to those calls at the moment, you go through that communication with the rest of the team. Are you seeing continued consumer price tolerance? Are you seeing a loss of pricing power? Is it anything like that from one sector to the other? Is it a broad story or different? So what I am seeing in terms of the consumer companies is that, and, and consumer related companies, right? Because we've got a lot of companies that have reported so far that aren't technically consumer, but are sort of in related areas. What I'm seeing is, is commentary about a choosier and pickier consumer. Uh, so consumers who are starting to push back a bit. Also, I've been fascinated on the pricing discussion. Generally, the commentary around things like pricing, inflation, kind of all of the opportunities and headwinds from 2022, that level of conversation is all going down very rapidly, so we're just not getting as much of it as we were. But on the pricing discussion in particular, I'm seeing softer discussions. It used to be like, hey, pricing is really strong. We're going to go out. We're going to pass it through. We're going to keep it going. We've got the ability to do that because of the cost environment. Now what I've noticed is that a number of companies in different industries are saying things like, well, the cost environment is getting better. Inflation is coming down. Pricing, you know, it's, it, we're still kind of lapping the benefits of, pr of past pricing, but pricing 
pricing is going to moderate as inflation moderates. So I do think the tone on pricing has changed dramatically from what we've seen over the past year or so. So Laurie, build on that. How can one make the argument right now to be in the more cyclical parts of the equity market at a time when maybe we're witnessing the beginning of a loss of, of pricing power? So I think it's a great question. And I do think we have to, you know, sort of separate out, separate out some of the different issues. I do think if you go back to last year, whether or not we end up getting a recession this year, you know, is, is up for debate. Regardless, we paid for it last year. And if you look at how the market's been acting since that October low, we're starting to see signs of small caps doing a little bit better. We're starting to see signs of lower quality, smaller cap stocks doing a little bit better, even within the Russell 1000. This market is acting like we're in a recovery trade, like we already had a recession, like we priced it in, and that we're pricing in that recovery now. So I think the continuation of that tailwind is what gives some of these cyclical sectors life, because a lot of this stuff that we're starting to go through has frankly already been priced into markets. I do think, though, that when you think about the earnings trajectory for next year, and that's maybe a different question from, you know, kind of what we're navigating for 2023 itself, I do think you have to temper your expectations on earnings a bit, because as pricing comes down, that is going to be a hit on revenues. Now, that doesn't mean it has to be a disaster for the market. I can still come up with a pretty robust scenario for markets next year with lower than expected earnings. You'll get some benefit on the multiple as inflation comes down. But I do think people really need to start thinking about that idea that as inflation moderates, you lose some of the benefits that have come from that inflation for companies, and earnings expectations may need to be tempered a bit. 12 minutes into the session, we are negative by 0.8% on the S&P 500, on the Nasdaq down by about one3 Laurie, as you basically want to temper the enthusiasm just a touch, I think one thing, one area where you stand out is your commitment still to core holdings in technology over a time horizon longer than five minutes. Laurie, why is that still important? So, you know, we, we really think about this concept of recovery. I'm not fighting yesterday's recession battle the way some strategists are, right? I'm thinking about the recovery. I do think the market's already priced in a lot of recovery for next year, but we really want to think about what kind of recovery are we going to have in 2024 and 2025. And the GDP stats are still coming in pretty sluggish at 2% or lower. And in a 2% or lower real GDP world, growth stocks typically outperform. And I'm not saying you have to go all in on growth right now. I do think some of those stocks are extended the valuations don't look great. But if we're wanting to really think about the long term, if we do see some weakness in some of those tech parts of the market, I think you want to add to them. I would be very selective, stick with the higher quality industries like software. But secular growth typically works best in a sluggish economic backdrop. And I do think that sluggish economic backdrop is what is the price we pay for perhaps skipping a recession or only having a mild one this year. Laurie, thank you for an update. Mm -hmm. Laurie Cavasina there of RBC on this equity market. Brilliant as always with her view on where things are going. 14 minutes into the session, this is where we're going right now, down by 0.7% on the S&P. The Nasdaq lower by more than one full percentage point. Coming up on this program, what a day in Washington, D.C. Fitch is, is older than the debt ceiling law. Whatever else is going on here, uh, you know, I think there's a, uh, a motivation that's a little less pure than a lot of people would uh, want us to talk about. Fallout from Fitch's U.S. downgrade and Trump indicted once again. That conversation up next. of global finance, economics, and politics, and wherever newsmakers are moving markets. Bloomberg brings you conversations that allow for deep discussions and important insights. How has that shaped your strategy for the bank? Is this a new normal? Is this like a catalyst? Do you think we're in a new phase for dividend policy overall? That's a great question. I'm Francine Lacroix, and this is The Pulse, every weekday at 9 a.m., only on Bloomberg. 
This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrell, and Lisa Abramowitz. It was unimaginable that we would see rates move this fast. That was not in the realm of thinking. Just the timeline of what they knew and when they knew it. Why didn't they do anything about it? When do we have to see the kill? <laughs> it's always for the Fed to respond to it. And this is really the tension. Be informed. You cannot be overly data dependent. You've got to have a view of where you're going. Be prepared. I think the earnings season might actually be the positive surprise that people are not expecting. Be ahead of the game. Certainly the beginning of something. Something we need to keep an eye on. And that, I think, is really going to be an interesting takeaway from this moment. You go all birds on us and you say, turn, turn, turn. Is that what we're doing right now? Yeah, big question coming into the show for us was when is that turn going to be? What a fantastic conversation. The news you need. The president's calling on manufacturers to make more in America. It is working, and it's reflected in these jobs numbers. The analysis you trust. How do you take this anecdotal data and say, really, just focus on the now, because that is going to tell you where we're going? What is the measurement of uncertainty that we have in studying the American economy? Milton Friedman had said there are long and variable lags in the impact of monetary policy. But man, it's a long slog. The best way to start your day. People are tuning into this program on a daily basis. Oh, well, come on. It yeah. makes for good TV. Let's move on. Bloomberg Surveillance. Weekdays from 6 to 9 a.m. Eastern. The names that move markets are on Bloomberg. Concentration in industry after industry after industry is a threat to our economy, it is a threat to innovation, and ultimately often leads to price gouging, whether it's consumers or the government. I believe in the power of markets, but they only work if we enforce the rules that keep competitors going rather than monopolists. Nobody covers business like Bloomberg, your global business authority. Is, is older than the debt ceiling law. Uh, they were founded three years before the first uh, debt ceiling law happened. And, you know, now they're bestirring themselves uh, to complain about the process th through which uh, the United States uh, appropriates money and, uh, and deals with its debt. Uh, so, you know, whatever else is going on here, uh, you know, I think there's a, uh, a motivation that's a little less pure than a lot of people would, uh, would want us to talk about. Fitch's downgrade sparking criticism almost across the board, including from the White House Press Secretary, Corinne Jean-Pierre, writing this. We strongly disagree with this decision. It defies reality to downgrade the United States at a moment when President Biden has delivered the strongest recovery of any major economy in the world. As if all of that wasn't enough drama, that decision came just moments before this. Today, an indictment was unsealed, charging Donald J. Trump with conspiring to defraud the United States conspiring to disenfranchise voters, and conspiring and attempting to obstruct an official proceeding. Let's get to the team coverage. Bloomberg's Anne-Marie back with us alongside Kelly Lyons in Washington, D.C. Morning, Kelly. Good morning, John. This is the third indictment of former President Trump, as the special counsel Jack Smith was laying out. There are four different charges here, including conspiracy to defraud the U.S. and conspiracy against rights, which is the right to vote and to have one's vote counted. Now, this indictment also named six other, uh, did not name six other co-conspirators, though it did say that they exist. They were not charged, just the former president. And these charges could carry upwards uh, close to 20 years in prison if convicted. Now, as for what happens next, Trump has been ordered to report to the magistrate judge at the federal courthouse here in Washington tomorrow, August 3rd at 4 p.m. Eastern time. And Jack Smith said in his remarks last night that he will seek a speedy trial. It is important to note here, though, John, Trump already is preparing for other trials and other indictments he has faced. He was indicted in Florida in the classified documents case, 40 counts of criminal charges there. That trial currently set for May of next year. He also was indicted in the state of New York related to hush money payments made to porn star Stormy Daniels. That trial is set for March. Plus, we could see another state indictment coming down later this month. The district attorney in Fulton County, Georgia, has long said she would bring charges into uh, the investigation into efforts to overturn the 2020 election in that state before September. So the legal battles and the legal bills are stacking up for this president, John. A lot of this will be coming during primary season uh, when the former president will be actively campaigning to seek re-election in the Republican nomination. 
nation, and he is bleeding money. The super PACs that are supporting him, as well as his campaign, yes, have raised millions of dollars, but they've spent tens of millions of dollars in legal fees already, and those bills are only posed to get higher. I would note in regard to the campaign, John, they did put out a statement in response to this indictment last night saying this is the latest corrupt chapter in trying to interfere with the 2024 presidential election. Amory, losing money. Is he losing voters? Oh, John, definitely not. Not at the money. He is, when it comes to voters, in the latest national poll, Siena, New York Times, what you see there is Trump is at 54 percent. DeSantis, who's the number two in this poll, and he's his closest rival at the moment, is only at 17 percent. What we've seen time and time again from the former president is that every time he's indicted, he actually surges in the polls, and not just in polls. He also brings in campaign donations that Kaylee just mentioned. And as those indictments help him bring more campaign money in, that campaign money then, Jonathan, has been used, more than $40 million worth, to fight these legal fees for him and his close associates. So even though these charges, the, the gravity of these charges are so serious, conspiracy to defraud the United States, conspiracy to not have an individual's vote counted, these are the most serious charges we have ever seen against the former president. As Kaylee mentioned, this is only the third indictment, and it is definitely a serious one. But at the same time, it is not hurting him at all with the Republican base. AMH, thank you. Alongside Kelly Lines, looking forward to the program. Balance of Power a little bit later on today, 5 p.m. Eastern time. No doubt that's going to be a top headline for them and the team down in Washington, D.C. The broader story in the market at the moment, let's call it 22 minutes into the session, we are pulling back by 0.8% on the S&P 500. On the NASDAQ, down a little bit more than that. Let's lift the lid on the index, get you some sector price action. Here's Abby. Yeah, John, we are looking at the worst decline for the S&P 500 in about two weeks. So not surprisingly, most sectors are down. The breadth that we had seen to the upside, well, it's now moving to the downside. Up top, though, healthcare up just slightly. Consumer staples and utilities up just slightly. That makes the day a little bit more risk off. Those are defensive sectors. On bottom, it's all about uh, the big tech sectors down more than 1%. Let's dig into that just a little bit more because from the peak last week, this sector, the S&P 500 tech sector, now down about 3%. Microsoft was one of the big tech stocks to close down in the month of July, a bit of an anomaly. But you have to wonder, is this the beginning of a little bit of cooling, at least for big tech? Abby, thank you. Stock Softer, your trading diary, up next. shaping the C-suite. Bloomberg's chief future officer shines a spotlight on these dynamic leaders. Today's CFO has to be much, much more than a bookkeeper. One of the most important things is looking around the corner. We have to let go of the traditional legacy department store. Their impact goes far beyond the balance sheet. And on chief future officer, they focus on much more than just revenues and margins. We also have to be credible business leaders in order to really impact the business and steer the direction. We are like biologists. We need to deeply understand the financial DNA of a company. People just come with a playbook and say, okay, we're going to roll that. Don't do that. Think longer term. It's an amazing time to be in this role. It's a lot more than the profit today. It's building the future of tomorrow. Get passion, perspective, and more from the chief future officers of some of the world's most influential companies. A new episode every month, only on Bloomberg. Pretty defensive stuff so far, 25 minutes into the session, outperforming staples, healthcare, 
utilities, everything else in negative territory led by a decline in tech. The Nasdaq down by about 1.4% at the moment. That's the price action. Here's the trading diary. The event you need to be looking for through the trading day. Qualcomm. Those earnings coming after the closing bell, ahead of Apple and Amazon after the close tomorrow. Another round of jobless claims tomorrow morning, plus durable goods orders too, and a Bank of England rate decision as well. Then we round things out this coming Friday. Friday, just around the corner, a couple of days away. Payrolls, the payrolls report, the estimate at the moment about 200 K. 200k after a decent upside surprise on the ADP report a little bit earlier. Stacked lineup on Friday, worth repeating once again. Mohammed Al Aaron alongside Rick Reader, Michael Collins, and Anastasia Amoroso. From New York City, that does it for me. Thank you for choosing Bloomberg TV and good luck for the rest of the trading day. This was the countdown to the open. This is Bloomberg. and money. They've always gone together. But never before have sports been so massively influential and as lucrative as they are today. NFL, NBA, none of them were what they are today when they were born. There's leagues that are being thought of and built every day. New teams, new leagues, new business models, even entirely new sports. I never in a million years would have thought this is what my life would be like. We set out to find what's happening and what's about to happen at the nexus of business, sports, and culture. Getting involved from a business perspective was something that was very natural and an easy transition for me. From the pickleball courts of Arizona. To the Kabaddi tournaments in India. To the cornhole boards at your local tailgate. Oh! This is what's next in sports. Street Week comes to you from Colorado. Join David Weston for the 2023 Aspen Economic Strategy Group meeting. Special guests Cecilia Rouse, Rafael Bostic, Brian Moynihan, David Cody, Austin Goolsby, and Larry Summers join David Weston for exclusive conversations on persistent inflation, rising debt, and demographic challenges in the U.S. and around the world. It's a Wall Street Week you won't want to miss. This Friday at 6 p.m. Eastern, only on Bloomberg Television and Radio. In a multi-trillion dollar industry, there's a lot of ground to cover. We indeed have a rally. We're talking a lot of dividends. We're talking income. We'll show you what's happening in ETFs like no one else. Bloomberg ETF IQ, Monday on Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Markets with Paul Sweeney. We got a lot of green on the screen here, but the volume is light. This is a market that's much more optimistic or bullish than maybe the central bankers are. 9.5 million job openings. What are people doing? Are they just sitting in Starbucks all day? Breaking market news and insight from Bloomberg experts. There's still some concern out there in the market that there is room for things to deteriorate a little bit more than what they're indicating. As small and medium-sized businesses struggle, they don't present as much competition. What are you guys thinking about hardware, software? How should investors 
investors approach this thing called AI. This is Bloomberg Markets with Paul Sweeney on Bloomberg Radio. Good Wednesday morning from the Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studio in New York City to our worldwide audience. It is August. Matt Miller is still on the European vacation strategy, so he is out, but not to worry. Molly Smith from Bloomberg News uh, and Bloomberg Tennis team is here to join us to fill in for Matt. Lots of important stuff coming up here today. Fitch downgrading the U.S. Uh, economy. What does it mean? Ira Jersey, chief U.S. interest rate strategist with Bloomberg Intelligence, will join us and give us his thought. He knows everything about the Treasury market. Selma Hep, chief economist at Core Logic, is also going to join us to talk about housing and her recent note on the housing market going forward. So we got a lot of stuff coming up. Uh, we're going to talk stocks. We're going to talk eco data. A lot of companies reporting earnings. So a lot of stuff uh, on the agenda for today. Let's kick it all off with John Tucker in a Bloomberg Business Flash. Yeah, there's quite a bit for investors to chew on this morning. We had the uh, hotter than estimated reading on the labor market from uh, the private payroll company ADP, based in New Jersey. Then uh, Treasury boosting the size of its debt sales just a day after a ratings cut by Fitch. The uh, tenure was up five basis points. The higher yields pressure technology stocks in particular. So we see that in the NASDAQ 100 right now. That's leading the declines among the major averages down about 1.3%. Well, like a lot of investors, Amy Wu Silverman at RBC Capital focused on earnings from Amazon and Apple. The two earnings we'll get tomorrow, which is, you know, kind of 20% of weighting will be very important. What's interesting for Amazon and Apple is you're actually seeing a divergence here. So Amazon's call skew is actually very high, meaning, you know, there's a good deal of bullish sentiment. That's actually not true in Apple. After the close of regular trading, we're going to get the results from Qualcomm. Uh, most active right now in the S&P 500 is advanced micro devices. Right now, it's down close to 4%. I'll say that's part of the, the broader sell-off in technology. Once again, the Dow Jones Industrial Average 169 points lower. The S&P 500 down 34 and the Nasdaq 100 204 points lower. A decline of 1.4%. And we check the markets all day long right here on Bloomberg Radio. I'm John Tucker and that is your Bloomberg Business Flash. Paul and Molly, how are you? Molly Smith, Bloomberg News, joins us. John, you weren't kidding. Automated data processing, ADP, based in Roseland, New Jersey. They have 60,000 employees. Right off Route 280. Nice. $102 billion market cap. That's a big company. It is a very big company. Huge. Awesome. So I didn't know that. It was ADP founded by, you know? No. A former U.S. Senator from New Jersey, Frank Lautenberg. Is that right? Yes. Oh, okay. That's interesting. ADP, $100 billion market cap company. How about that? Um, good stuff. Molly, thanks for joining us today. Happy to be here. We're not sure where Matt is. It might be some Spanish resort, but you know, we, I mean, he works hard. He deserves his time off, you know. So he gets his six or eight weeks or whatever they do over there in Europe. But uh, we're still here. Have, yeah, right. and um, on ADP Day of all things, it's uh, one of the ones on the economy team. We kind of. Love to hate on. A yeah, bit. I don't know. If, you know, I looked at my, my eco screen and I saw the ADP print go up. Or ADP employment change up 324,000 jobs. The consensus was for 190,000. So it seems like the, I, I don't know what to do with the ADP data. I mean, I guess directionally it gives us a sense of where where things are going. I don't know. It's down from the 497, which was a blowout number the last month, uh, which did get revised a little bit lower, but still. It's really just been giving a lot of conflicting signals compared to the government report that we're all going to get on Friday, and that really is the benchmark employment yep. report. So I think most economists and people on the street would tell you that ADP is a lot of noise, a lot of noise. and would not read too much into it. Change in non-farm payrolls, uh, and Molly, you're referring to on Friday, uh, looking for a consensus of uh, 200,000, uh, which is still a good print, um, 209,000 was last month, so we'll keep an eye on that for Friday. Uh, Elena Popina joins us here. She is on the Bloomberg U.S. Equities team. She joins us here in our Bloomberg Interactive Brokers studio. Elena, what are you seeing out there in the marketplace? A lot of interesting actions in the market activity right now. You know, we see a lot of broader market things, but we also see a lot of really interesting movers. You know, one of them is Advanced Macro Devices, ticker MAD. You know, it is all over the place. So it reported earnings that far outpaced analyst expectations. So they were talking about its data center business that is booming. They were talking about its AI business that is on pace for a good 
for a good start. You know, there are a lot of headwinds down the road, but you know, all in all, you know, it's it's a very decent uh, earnings report and a very decent start. AMD is how we're now syncing with the broader market. It was up more than two percent early. It is slightly lower, so it's a very interesting development right now, especially with some of its peers reporting the results later uh, this afternoon and tomorrow. Um, another one is Match Group ticker MTCH. It is up 11 percent after it reported revenue of its Tinder business that far outpaced estimates. You know, Match also owns a few other you know branches. It owns OkCupid, it owns Hitch, it's dating yep. season in the Northern Hemisphere. John Tucker's so all over it's that a lot of, yeah, <laughs> it's, it's, it's a lot of things that are driving Match.com up 11%. Swiping right on Match. Um, let's talk about, Elena, you also had flagged to us that it's been how long since the S&P posted its last 1% decline? 47 sessions. That's so crazy. So the last 1% decline was before Memorial Day weekend, Mark, the official, unofficial, I should say, start of summer. If we get Connection through lost. Labor Day without that 1% decline, it's going to be the calmest summer, meteorological summer, since <laughs> 1979. Mind you, a lot can happen in the next you know, four months, uh, four weeks. We have uh, you know, Jackson Hall, we have ADP report, we have jobs report, we have CPI. So a lot can happen, but you know, it's been unusually common. Some people are getting paranoid that it may not last long. What other names are you looking at out there? There's a lot of earnings out there as well. Any other names out there in this market? I am looking at AMD. I'm looking at Qualcomm uh, out to report uh, its results later this afternoon. Uh, obviously, there is a lot of big tech that's going to set to report. Yep. The broader uh, earnings theme for big tech has been better than expected. The, the okay. earnings reports have been quite good. So, you know, it remains to be seen if that weakness, if that, if that strength is going to continue with the results uh, tomorrow and on Friday. I was taking a look at Uber, too. It's first ever operating profit that it reported in this latest quarter. But uh, apparently that um, the pace is still slower than from the highs during the pandemic and the shares were down earlier today anyways. Looks like they're coming up a little positive now. But how about that? Finally, Uber turns a positive profit. Yeah, I mean, that was good news. And, uh, you know, it's interesting. That the market cap of Uber, which is a gajillion dollars, versus like four, five, six billion for Lyft, it's amazing the different the divergence between Uber and Lyft. I didn't see that at the IPO. I kind of kind of felt like they were kind of the same companies, but apparently this Uber eats thing. Yeah, and thing. Uber had a lot of roadblocks around along the way. You know, it was a tricky IPO to begin with, so it was a very tricky road. The past couple of months have been challenging. The quarterly results were you know below expectations, so you know it remains to be seen what the future trajectory is going to look like. All right, when we get uh, tomorrow's a big uh, earnings day after the close, Apple and Amazon. So for tech watchers, that'll be big. And you know, Amazon, I guess it's about the cloud, and Apple, it's about. Are you upgrading your iPhone? Are you? I, I don't know. I, mean, I already upgrading? did. I think, but it's also the PC growth. So, mm. you know, not too many people are concerned about the core iPhone business, but the PC business, you know, with its new uh, uh, MacBook Pros, you know, yep. how that's going to turn out, what people are going to like, whether people are going to like it or not. That's yep. a big question. All right. We'll see. Uh, tomorrow we'll be having uh, Carol Master will have all that stuff uh, at Bloomberg Business Week uh, after the close uh, tomorrow. Elena Popina, thanks so much for joining us. Elena is on the Bloomers, Bloomberg Equity. Uh, team and covering the markets. We appreciate getting some time here. All right, let's kind of get back to what it th is the political issue, apparently building of uh, the day of the week and probably through the election uh, that is uh, former President Trump and his indictment on the January 6th uh, uprising. Nick Ackerman joins us. This is former assistant special Watergate prosecutor. Nick, uh, as, as one of our Bloomberg Opinion columnists wrote this morning, this is the big one for former President Trump. How do you think this will play out? Oh, I think it is absolutely a devastating indictment. Uh, you just read through the facts. It tells the entire story of what Donald Trump did after the election, straight up until January 6th, to try and stay in power uh, illegally. Um, it is definitely a big one. But keep in mind, the other indictments are serious also. If you just look at the district attorney's indictment in Manhattan, um, even though it has to do with falsifying business records, uh, the indictment alleges that he did so basically to defraud voters uh, so that they wouldn't know about his payments of hush money to Stormy Daniels um, prior to the 2016 election. 
This particular indictment uh, relates to his efforts to lie to voters um, in order to keep himself in power after the 2020 election. So both of these indictments really make neat bookends. And of course, the whole indictment relating to classified documents um, is really separate and apart from the voters and the elections. Nick, tell us about the timing of this and how it relates to the 2024 election. And if, um, you know, winning the presidency again, if that's really Trump's best possible defense here, it kind of seems like it's the get out of jail free card. Well, no question. It's the get out of jail card free here. Um, but uh, the, you got to look at a couple things on timing. Uh, the reason that Jack Smith brought this case just against Donald Trump is to keep the case lean and mean and simple so that he can get this case to trial somewhere around the 70-day period required by the Speedy Trial Act. I think, realistically, he could get this case to trial in January or February prior to the DA investigation of in the trial that's scheduled for March. So I think that is part of what he's looking to do to get a verdict, a guilty verdict, um, prior to March. Um, secondly, in terms of the politics of this entire matter, um, one indictment coming down after another indictment, sooner or later, uh, Republican senators, House members, um, people who are running for governor on the Republican ticket have got to ask themselves, do they really want to expose themselves to having the head of their ticket under indictment, which will ultimately, in the next 10 to 15 days, will be about four times? And do they really want to answer questions that are going to be based on specific facts in all of these indictments that are absolutely devastating for Donald Trump and will be devastating for the Republican Party members to try to deal with over the course of the next election? Not that he doesn't have enough on his plate already from a legal perspective, but what do we know about what may happen from the Georgia court in, term of, in terms of timing? Because that's also another big election uh, issue for him. Well, exactly. And that one, unlike the one that was just, just came down yesterday, is likely to include a whole number of defendants. Uh, Fannie Willis, who is a expert in the Georgia RICO statute, um, which simply allows her to bring in many crimes as one crime and be able to tell the entire story of Trump's efforts to undermine the vote in Georgia, I think is going to be a real blockbuster in the sense that um, a lot of the people that were named as unindicted co-conspirators in this most recent indictment are going to be named as defendants uh, in the Fulton County indictment. Um, it's kind of interesting because... I know that I think that Fannie Willis has said that she has not communicated um, with DOJ or Jack Smith on this indictment, um, but this is not atypical of what happens sometimes where certain defendants and certain matters are divided up. And I think what you're going to have here is this federal indictment that goes after Donald Trump himself. Maybe there'll be other federal indictments, but certainly the Georgia indictment is going to include a lot of these same mm. unindicted co-conspirators and more and cover more Georgia-centric uh, types of activities. Hey, Nick, you know, when I look at the legal representation for former President Trump, I don't see a lot of white shoe law firms that names that I recognize. Who are his attorneys? Are they any good? What do we know about them? Can he mount, in all of these various cases, can he mount a reasonable defense? Well, I mean, that's a real problem for him. I mean, his big problem is that attorneys don't like to sign on with Donald Trump, especially big law firms don't want their names besmirched. Every attorney uh, that's been connected with Donald Trump in some way uh, has fallen into the mud with Donald Trump. Um, secondly, he doesn't pay his bills. Oops. Um, and that is a huge problem if you're a lawyer and you've got to devote <laughs> the amount of time you need to devote to a case like this. You don't want to do it as a charity case. You know, you had mentioned, Nick, about the idea of keeping this lean and mean and just focused on Trump. Um, I was uh, poking around on, I guess we'll call it X now, not Twitter, <laughs> and saw that right. um, Ginny Thomas was trending this morning 
as uh, possibly one of the unnamed co-conspirators. Wonder if you would uh, venture to, you know, think out loud here of who the others might be, or if she could, if there's a case that she could be one of them. I don't think so. I mean, I went through the list and pretty much, I mean, Rudy Giuliani is clearly co-conspirator one. Um, the um, uh, uh, Sidney Powell is, I think, co-conspirator three. Um, you've got uh, John Eastman, who I think is co-conspirator number two. Um, I don't see Ginny Thomas being in, in the list there of people uh, that are part of this. Um, I mean, she was on the periphery of this. I don't think she was a major player. She had put in her two cents with uh, Mike, Mark Meadows, um, Donald Trump's chief of staff. Um, but no, I would be surprised if she turns out to be a, a big player in this indictment. Anything about Clarence? Um, I don't think so. I mean, there is a reference there where they tried to get, um, one of their plans was to try and get an order from the Supreme Court um, at some point. And, and we know that what they were trying to do was set this up so Clarence Thomas uh, would issue an order that would give them some kind of credibility in terms of what they were doing. So I think that's going to come into play here. But again, um, I don't think Clarence Thomas is going to be a big player and somebody to be watching in this case. Nick, the people to watch are yeah. really Mark Meadows and um, others, uh, the lawyers who uh, were the in-house counsel, uh, Mike Pence. I mean, keep in mind, the witnesses in this case are all going to be Donald Trump um, you know, employees and people that work for Donald Donald Trump. These are not left-wing, crazy Atifa people. Um, this is <laughs> Donald Trump's own, you know, courtry of people. I mean, these are his pals that are testifying against him. Nick, great stuff. As always, I'm not sure there's a better voice uh, on this uh, than Nick Ackerman, former assistant special Watergate prosecutor Nick uh, Ackerman. Thank you so much for your time for this unfolding issue, and uh, it just seems like it's uh, never ending. There are so many layers it's hard to keep track of. Um, I find some of the helpful reporting, at least for me, when I kind of spend my time looking at this stuff, is just reminding kind of what's out there. Where are we? What stage are we at in these various things? It's so hard to keep track of, and to think that this is somebody who might be elected president in a, year, a little over a year from now, and trying to keep track of all the charges against him. Um, I'm just as lost as you are. Uh, we'll keep up with it. <laughs> this is Bloomberg. All right, let's get some company news right now with Steve Rappaport. Good morning, Paul. Shares of CVS were lower, but the stock is back in positive territory, now up more than 3%. This after the drugstore chain topped estimates for second quarter profit and sales. More from Bloomberg's Abigail Doolittle. They beat on the surface level. Uh, prescriptions filled uh, was a positive. The revenue grew 7.6% to nearly $29 billion. The insurance medical benefit ratio grew to 86.2%. The bad news of next year and the year after for 2024, they're saying they can no longer meet their guidance of $9 per uh, share, earnings per share. And for 2025, they can no longer meet $10 of earnings per share. So that is weighing on the stock. Thanks, Abigail. Amazon is launching the biggest overhaul of its grocery business since acquiring Whole Foods six years ago. Bloomberg's Jeff Bellinger reports. Steve, the changes include revamping stores, testing new highly automated warehouses, and for the first time offering fresh food delivery to customers who are not Prime subscribers. The company also plans to streamline the shopping experience by merging its various e-commerce supermarket offerings into one online cart. Amazon is hungry for a bigger slice of the U.S. grocery market that is worth an estimated one and a half trillion dollars, according to analysts at UBS. The tech giant says the changes will roll out in the coming weeks and months. Steve? Thanks, Jeff. And the nation's largest retailer still reigns supreme. Walmart tops Fortune's Global 500 list for the 10th year in a row. And those are the company stories we're following this hour. I'm Steve Rappaport. This is Bloomberg. Stay tuned for more Bloomberg Markets with Paul Sweeney coming up right after this.
Sports, headlines, and breaking news 24 hours a day at Bloomberg.com, on Bloomberg Television, and the Bloomberg Business app. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. And I'm John Sucker in the Bloomberg Newsroom with this Bloomberg Business Flash. Uh, right now, yields are in the driver's seat. The 10-year U.S. Treasury yield at the highest level since November. Right now, 4.09%. That's a rise of seven basis points today. The higher yields, uh, that's eating into the premium that's placed on technology stocks in particular. Uh, so why are the yields higher? Uh, traders digesting the uptick in government issuance uh, when they do the auction next week. A sovereign credit downgrade, that came from Fitch. And then, stronger than expected, a private job report from uh, ADP. We got that this morning. The earnings include CVS Health. Uh, Steve just talked about that. And then uh, you have uh, among the most actively traded stocks this morning, AMD. It was better than expected, but uh, right now the stock is lower. That was down about 5%, being swept up in the uh, broader technology sell-off. Amazon and Apple they're going to report their earnings tomorrow. We check the markets for you. Well, let me do the uh, S&P 500. Down 43 points. Down just about nine-tenths of a percent. The Nasdaq 100, 255 points lower. That's a decline of 1.6 percent. The Dow right now, 207 points lower. That is down 6 percent. And we check the markets for you all day long. Right here on Bloomberg Radio, I'm John Tucker, and that is your Bloomberg Business Flash. Molly and Paul. All right, John Tucker, thank you so much. We appreciate that. Molly Smith, Paul Sweeney here live in the Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studio. And guess what? We're streaming live. That's right. You can get the video version here on YouTube. Just go to YouTube and search Bloomberg Global News. All right. When I saw the news that Fitch downgraded the U.S. government, I was surprised. It just didn't seem very patriotic to me. <laughs> uh, but I'll tell you who is not surprised, and that's Ira Jersey and his team. Ira is the uh, chief U.S. Strateg uh, rate strategist at uh, Bloomberg Intelligence. He wrote back on May 25th that, quote, political partisanship causing a rolling debt ceiling crisis and continued deficits well over 3% of GDP doesn't suggest that a AAA rating is warranted. Ira, you were so right here. I mean, what's Fitch? I mean, they're joining some other rating agencies that have already done it, but that doesn't seem very patriotic. What's going on out there? <laughs> yeah, well, so it's been 12 years since S&P downgraded yep. the U.S. from AAA to AA+, plus, and almost of the week, actually, because that was uh, on or about August 6th that, that S&P did it. Um, so so I, I think they just – they saw the uh, the Treasury borrowing uh, estimate from Monday night that came out at 3 o'clock where the Treasury Department said, hey, we're going to borrow over a trillion dollars just this quarter, just this current quarter, um, and, uh, and we expect to have to borrow a lot more later. So – and Fitch, between that and between the uh, you know another debt ceiling crisis that you know was averted again at the last minute back in June, um, you know they just felt that the U.S. is not yet is not AAA anymore. And quite frankly, I can't blame them because under you know the, when you look at all of the AAA rated countries around the world, there's not that many. And you know the U.S. debt burden doesn't look anything like Germany's, for example, which is one of the uh, one of the only AAA rated sovereigns left in the in the world. Um, so you know it may. Maybe if, if we were uh, willing to get rid of this debt ceiling problem that, that we keep on having to do every two years, maybe Fitch would have had a different opinion. But, um, you know, I, I can't say that it's a huge surprise that it happened. You know, maybe the timing a little bit. We expected it to happen maybe after this morning's announcement. But, you know, it's still not a huge uh, not a huge surprise. I don't think markets care very much about that. I think they're, the market, the Treasury market, is uh, reacting a lot more to the higher supply that was announced uh, just this morning. Right. That seems like the timing is really the biggest question mark around all of this on the in terms of the market reaction that we're seeing. And um, so you had flagged in your note, Ira, that just came out that um, the Treasury coupons being um, a bit of a factor in this. Um, I was even wondering, too, when um, when credit agencies issue a ratings watch, those are typically resolved in what, three to six months? So I guess we're kind of coming up on that period. So what do you think was really the principal driver in the timing here? Yeah, so 60-ish to 90 days. I, I think it was really the fiscal outlook that kind of drove Fitch over the edge. Um, obviously, they were thinking about it for, for a while. And it's not unusual for the rating agencies to come out with their new sovereign ratings over the summer. Um, you know, again, like S&P downgraded the U.S. right around the, the debt ceiling issue that we had in 2011. Um, but but the, this is also the time when they refresh their rating, so their annual review of, of sovereign debt ratings. So, so, again, like I don't think the... 
the precise timing was a little bit of a surprise, but I think the general timing, not quite as much, right? So 60 days-ish after they uh, initiated their watches, isn't that that surprising? The the, the market reaction to your, your issue about talking about coupons, you know, the 10-year um, started to sell off and, and a lot of the Treasury started to sell off after the stronger than expected ADP report. But some of the details of the Treasury refunding announcement were interesting in that the government decided that it was going to increase the amount of 10-year bond, a 10-year note said it's going to issue by $3 billion uh, uh, this month, uh, just next week. Um, that was a little bit more than I think most people were expecting. We were all expecting increases everywhere. We knew that the government was going to have to do that. But they chose specifically to increase the 10-year more than they did the 30-year, for example. Um, and, and I think that's one of the reasons why you're seeing 10-year yields um, sell off a little bit more than than, uh, than other places along the yield curve. So, Ira, uh, Liz McCormick of Bloomberg News is reporting this morning that the Treasury said it will sell $103 billion of longer-term securities at its so-called quarterly refunding auctions next next week. And I got to tell you, Ira, if I get a phone call from the Treasury asking me to pony up, I'm going to pass. I got to tell you, a little <laughs> tapped out here. But my question to you is, given this downgrade, will that change who shows up next week to bid on these uh, government bonds? Yeah, it, it it probably won't. Um, you know, the uh, I, I think that the single one of the biggest fallacies that I've been talking with customers about this morning is that there's this idea that uh, that there's a lot of mandates and people who own treasuries because they're AAA. Uh, so most mandates say U.S. government securities, securities of agency of U.S. government agencies. So Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, and the home loan banks. And investment grade corporate bonds. So, so even the AAA that can only own AAA or AA mandates, um, they still specify treasuries and agency mortgages as their own asset class. So the ratings are irrelevant for those uh, for those particular uh, instruments. Now, you know, if the U.S. were to be rated to double B or something, maybe that would change uh, the, the way that people uh, change their outlook. But when you look at a country like Japan, for example, they have a much higher debt to GDP ratio than the U.S. They are. Are slightly lower rated, and their their yields on their bonds are significantly lower. Now, a big part of that is because the Bank of Japan has been buying a lot of bonds, but they still probably, even without the Bank of Japan in the market, probably wouldn't have yields at five percent or four and a half percent, and you know, similar to parts of the U.S. curve. So, Ira, I know that when um, credit agencies are what they're rating is the creditworthiness of the borrower. And it, it's just coming at an interesting time here when the economy is doing really well. And you're hearing all these more calls that, you know, more people are optimistic that we're going to avert a recession. The soft landing case has never looked better. You know, to someone who maybe is having a tough time squaring the two, what would you say to them? Well, I think there, there's two pieces to this on the fiscal side of things. I think one is we've seen pretty massive wage gains in by the um, household sector when you go back and you look at what happened in 2022 and to so far in 2023. But that has not really translated into significantly higher tax revenues. And so, so because you still have fiscal spending from the um, fr from the uh, uh, Inflation Reduction Act, as well as still a little bit of the 2021 stimulus still being pushed into the system, you have uh, still deficit that are over one and a half trillion dollars a year and probably will be in fiscal 2024 as well. Um, so unless you wind up, unless that good economy really winds up pushing up tax revenue significantly, you're going to continue to have a pretty uh, not a good fiscal situation. On top of that, you have more and more baby boomers retiring. That's forcing more and more money out of the Social Security system. The Social Security now has to be funded. So whereas, yeah. um, you know, just a couple of years ago, that your Social Security taxes went to the people who were retired. That's not the case anymore. It just doesn't cover it. The Social Security taxes that we're collecting today doesn't cover 100% of the outflows of that program. So, so we have to figure out some way either to raise taxes or to raise government debt. There's are the only two ways to get those mandates uh, fully funded. Yeah, I'm starting to pay a little bit more attention to that whole Social Security discussion than maybe I did a few years ago. I don't know, maybe it's just me. Um, Ira, so when we have these um, auctions next week, the government's going to have to pay up more. Well, I guess my question is, will they have to pay up more than they did, say, yesterday before the downgrade? 
Well, if, assuming yields stay where they are right now, the, the answer is yes. And yeah. I think that that's one of the reasons you're seeing the sell-off today is, is just this idea that, you know, yeah, maybe a little bit on Fitch, but but just the idea that um, we are going to have more supply. Um, you know, next year, uh, next week, we get the three-year auction, 10-year and 30-year. And that's a lot of duration. So that's a lot of market risk that the that investors have to absorb. Um, now, we've seen reasonably decent auctions. They've been, you know, somewhat mixed, but we saw a pretty good 10-year auction last month. So the question is will that um, will, will that relate today uh, th- this week? Keep in mind too is that you have old ten year notes maturing uh, on the fifteenth of the month that were issued ten years ago. So those uh, so, so people who own some of those and held them to maturity might think about reinvesting some of that into the current ten year note. So refunding auctions tend to be a somewhat different animal than. Um, than the auctions that you get in the subsequent couple of months, and and uh, obviously this three billion dollar larger size, I think, could have an effect. So so I I, I think your risk, uh, Paul, is that you wind up will see somewhat higher yields at next week's auction because of the excess supply. All right, Ira, good stuff as always. Ira Jersey, chief U.S. interest rate strategist for Bloomberg Intelligence, chief soccer strategist for uh, Bloomberg uh, LP, uh, Real Central New Jersey uh, is his club, as they say. They don't say field, they say pitch and all this kind of stuff. And it's you know, as game, somebody from match. northern New schedule. Jersey, we might also contest the central Jersey <laughs> denomination. Well, that's the thing. I mean, <laughs> and John can wait here. I, I'm a North Jersey, South Jersey guy. I'm, I don't, and I'm from Trenton, exactly. but I don't identify and even acknowledge a central Jersey thing. Well, where it's would just, you fall in Trenton then? You can't get more central than that. I so, mean, what would you say? I'm a South Jersey. Okay, you know? that's a, then, yeah, closer to yeah. Philly than New York. Yeah, now I'm in Summit. I'm in I'm a North Jersey guy. Let's uh, sit down to know. Washington D.C. They have face. none of these issues. Amy Morris <laughs> is down there with the World of National News. Oh, we have those issues. The word Jersey just isn't involved. Thank you, Paul. <laughs> the legal pressure continues to build around former President Donald Trump, even as he remains the front runner in his race to return to the White House. Special counsel Jack Smith says Trump knowingly spread false claims about the 2020 election in a conspiracy to defraud the U.S. and American voters. Since the attack on our capital, the Department of Justice has remained committed to ensuring accountability for those criminally responsible for what happened that day. This case is brought consistent with that commitment. Special counsel Jack Smith spoke after the indictment was unsealed in Washington. Terry Haynes is founder of Pangea Policy, and he tells Bloomberg the mounting legal trouble for the former president is death by a thousand paper cuts. It's another cut, mitigated only because uh, we all had a pretty good idea it was coming. What we've seen in Washington in the past week is a, is a lot of truth stretching uh, all the way around. Terry Haynes with Pangea Policy says just in the past week, there is more uncertainty about who will be the nominees in the 2024 presidential race. Former Vice President Mike Pence says Donald Trump should never be president again and is a distraction. It is his strongest criticism yet of his former boss and current campaign rival. He released a statement saying, quote, our country is more important than one man. The former vice president testified before the grand jury and is a central figure in the 45-page indictment of Trump. His name or the office of the vice president are mentioned more than 100 times. China's capital is recorded its heaviest rainfall in 140 years over the past few days. More than 29 inches of rain fell between Saturday and Wednesday morning, destroying roads, knocking out power, and causing at least 20 deaths. 27 people still missing. Global News, 24 hours a day, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Amy Morris. This is Bloomberg.
sports, headlines, and breaking news 24 hours a day at Bloomberg.com, on Bloomberg Television, and the Bloomberg Business app. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. And I'm John Sucker in the Bloomberg Newsroom with this Bloomberg Business Flash. Uh, technology shares leading the declines as the 10-year yield has risen to its November high. You had the ADP payroll report that was hotter than expected. The government has to sell more debt than expected. And then Fitch downgraded the U.S. credit rating. Uh, investors now looking ahead to Friday's jobs report from the Labor Department. And Citigroup Global Chief Economist Nathan Sheets predicts a better than expected report. The real narrative is we continue to see the U.S. labor market as being very strong and buoyant. And I think the underlying driver of that is the U.S. consumer spending on services remains very strong. And services are labor intensive. Again, we're going to get that Friday morning from the Labor Department. S&P 500 right now, 46 points lower, a decline of 1%. We're at 45.29 on the index. The Dow Jones Industrial Average, 221 points lower. That is a decline of six tenths of a percent, 35,409. And the Nasdaq 100 down 262 points, a decline of 1.7 percent. The 10 year yield, 4.09 percent. That is seven basis points higher. And we check the market for you all day long, right here on Bloomberg Radio. I'm John Tucker. That's your Bloomberg Business Flash, Molly and Paul. Hey, John Tucker, thank you so much. We appreciate that. Molly Smith, Paul Sweeney here in our Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studio. Also doing that uh, YouTube thing, so just head over to YouTube and type in, uh, in the search Bloomberg Global News, and that'll or Bloomberg Global Markets, or Bloomberg, Bloomberg Global News, I think, gets it to you. Uh, that'll bring it right to the feed there. So, um, you know, I recently closed on the Jersey Shore Estate, the compound, if you will, and my mortgage had a six handle, and I was not happy. Now I'm looking at the bank rate, 30-year mortgage rate, 7.31%. You got a deal. I got a deal. I got a deal. And but you I don't closed know. a victory. Yes, exactly. <laughs> um, now, now what do we do? I mean, what's this market doing? Nobody wants to get out of their house here. Selma Hep, chief economist at CoreLogic, joins us. Selma, give us a lay of the land of the kind of the residential real estate market today in a world where a 30-year fix is 7.3%. Yeah, like you said, nobody wants to move at the moment. And so residential housing market is really suffering, particularly the existing market, because on the new home side, uh, builders and developers, they can, they can step in and provide some uh, mortgage rate buy-down offers. So, so there's sort of a story of two markets still, one where there is no inventory because existing inventory is locked up, and the other one uh, where there is m much more movement, and that's where, where there's uh, more new, co new home construction. Yeah, so we had a story the other day. Uh, it was taking a survey from Zillow and looking at um, kind of pegging 5% as the mortgage rate that's the tipping point of if you're below 5%. Uh, you're twice as likely to hold on to your home, but if you're above 5%, that's more when you're likely to sell. I mean, it, it, do you have you kind of drawn a line in the sand of where you see people as more likely to lean one way or the other? Yeah, I mean, I've seen surveys, a uh, couple of surveys uh, to that extent, showing that five and a half percent is the magic rate at which you know there's there would be more uh, uh, people would be more willing to move. So you know, I mean, think about it this way: you know, 69, 96 percent of uh, existing mortgages are uh, below six percent. So Oops. that's you know that quite a bit special. of a market. <laughs> Excuse me. And that makes me special being in that four percent. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> See? Right. right. Well, I, I myself locked in at 6.3 uh, in March of this year, and I was very unhappy about it. <laughs> so uh, what does new construction need to do here? I mean, is this simply a, a situation where this is an industry that requires more inventory? We need more housing? Well, 